about the breakdown of credit rating agencies. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. On the left, uh, Virginia Representative Tom Davis, the ranking Republican on the House Oversight Committee. This will be his last term in Congress. This hearing today, the third of five House scheduled House oversight hearings on the financial markets. Today, looking at the credit rating agencies, and they'll have the heads of the uh, couple of the top agencies, including Moody's and Standard & Poor's, should get underway in just a minute here, live on C-SPAN. Oversight Committee gathering for this hearing this morning in the third of five scheduled hearings looking at financial markets. The chair of the committee, Henry Waxman of California, about to gavel in. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. Today the committee is holding its third hearing on the financial crisis on Wall Street. Our subject today is the role of the credit rating agencies. The leading credit rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's & Fitch, are essential financial gatekeepers. They rate debt obligations based on the ability of the issuers to make timely payments. A AAA rating has been regarded as the gold standard for safety and security of these investments for nearly a century. As our financial markets have grown more complex, the role of the credit rating agencies has grown in importance. Between 2002 and 2007, Wall Street issued a flood of securities and collateralized debt obligations called CDOs, backed by risky subprime loans. These new financial inventions were so complex that virtually very few people really understood them. For investors, a triple A rating became the stamp of approval that this investment is safe. And for Wall Street's investment banks, a triple A rating became the independent validation that turned a pool of risky home loans into a financial gold mine. The leading credit rating agencies grew rich, rating mortgage backed securities and CDOs. Uh, and we have a chart. I hope we can display it. That chart will show the total re revenues for the three firms devil from $3 billion in 2002 to over $6 billion in 2007. At uh, Moody's, profits quadrupled 
between 2000 and 2007. In fact, Moody's had the highest profit margin of any company in the S&P 500 for five years in a row. Unfortunately for investors, the AAA ratings that proved so lucrative for the rating agencies soon evaporated. S&P has downgraded more than two-thirds of its investment grade ratings. Moody's had to downgrade over 5,000 mortgage-backed securities. In their testimony today, the CEOs of Standard & Poor's, Moody's and Fitch will tell us that, quote, virtually no one anticipated what is occurring, end quote. But the documents the committee obtained tell a different story. Ray McDaniel, the CEO of Moody's, will testify, testify today that, quote, we have witnessed events that many, including myself, would have thought unimaginable just two months ago, end quote. But thought that is not what he said in a confidential presentation he made to the board of directors in October 2007. The title of the presentation is Credit Policy Issues at Moody's Suggested by the Subprime Liquidity Crisis. In this presentation, Mr. McDaniel describes what he calls a dilemma and a very tough problem facing Moody's. According to Mr. McDaniel, and I'm quoting, the real problem is not that the market underweights rating quality, but rather that in some sectors it actually penalizes quality. It turns out that ratings quality has surprisingly few friends. Issuers want high ratings. Investors don't want ratings downgrades. Short-sighted bankers let labor short-sightedly to game the rating agencies." End quote. Mr. McDaniel then tells his board, and I want to quote, unchecked com competition on this basis can place the entire financial system at risk, end quote. Mr. McDaniel describes to his board how Moody's has, quote, erected safeguards to keep teams from too easily solving the market share problem by lowering standards, end quote. But then he says, quote, this does not solve the problem, end quote. In his presentation, the not is written in all capitals. He then turns to a topic that he calls rating erosion by persuasion. According to Mr. McDaniel, quote, analysts and MDs, managing directors, are continually pitched by bankers, issuers, investors, and sometimes we drink the Kool-Aid, end quote. A month earlier, in September 2007, Mr. McDaniel participated in a managing director's town hall, and we obtained a copy of the transcript of the proceeding. And let me read to you what Mr. McDaniel said. The purpose of this town hall is so that we can speak as candidly as possible about what's going on in the subprime market. What happened was it was a slippery slope. What happened in 04 and 05 with respect to subordinated tranches is that our competition, Fitch and S&P, went nuts. Everything was investment grade. It didn't really matter. We tried to alert the market. We said we're not rating it. This stuff isn't investment grade. No one cared because the machine just kept going. The following day, a member of the Moody's management team commented, quote, we heard two answers yesterday. One, people lied, and two, there was an unprecedented, unprecedented sequence of events in the mortgage markets. As for one, it seems to me that we had blinders on and never questioned the information we were given. As for two, it's our job to think of the worst case scenarios and model them. 
Combine these two errors make us look either incompetent at credit analysis or like we sold our soul to the devil for revenue. The documents from Standard & Poor's paints a similar picture. In one document, an S&P employee in the Structured Finance Division writes, quote, it could be structured by cows and we would rate it, end quote. In another, an employee asserts, quote, rating agencies continue to create an ever bigger monster, the CDO market. Let's hope we are wealthy, let's hope we are all wealthy and retired by the time this house of cards falters, end quote. There were voices in the credit rating agencies that called for a change, and we're going to hear from two of them on our first panel, Frank Rader from Stanford, Standard & Poor's and Jerome Fawns from Moody's. In 2001, Mr. Rader was asked to rate an early collateralized debt obligation called Pinstripe. He asked for the collateral tapes so that he could assess the creditworthiness of the home loans backing the CDO. This is a response he got from Richard Gugliotta, the managing director. Any request for loan level tapes is totally unreasonable. Most investors don't have it and can't provide it. Nevertheless, we must produce a credit estimate. It's your responsibility to provide those credit estimates and your responsibility to devise some method for doing so. Mr. Rader was stunned. He was being directed to rate Pinstripe without access to essential credit data. He emailed back, quote, this is the most amazing memo I have ever received in my business career, end quote. Last November, Christopher Mahoney, Moody's vice chairman, wrote Mr. McDaniel, the CEO, that Moody's has made mistakes and urged that the manager in charge of the securitization area should be held to account. Mr. Mahoney's employment was terminated by the end of the year. Investors, too, were stunned by the lax practices of the credit rating agencies. The documents we reviewed show that a portfolio manager with Vanguard, the large mutual fund company, told Moody's over a year ago that the rating agencies, quote, allow issuers to get away with murder, end quote. A senior official at Fortis Investment was equally blunt, saying, quote, if you can't figure out the loss ahead of the fact, what's the use of your ratings? If the ratings are BS, the only use in ratings is comparing BS to more BS, end quote. Some large investors like PIMCO tried to warn Moody's about the mistakes it was making, but according to the documents, they eventually gave up because they, quote, found the Moody's analyst to be arrogant and gave the indication we're smarter than you, end quote. Six years ago, Congress pressed the SEC to assert more control over the credit raging agencies. In 2002, the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee investigated the rating agencies and found serious problems. The committee concluded that meaningful SEC oversight was urgently needed. The next year, the SEC published its own report which also found serious problems with credit rating agencies. Initially it, looked like the, initially, it looked like the SEC might take action. In June 2003, the SEC issued a concept release seeking comments on possible new regulations. Two years later, in April 2005, SEC issued a proposed rule. Yet despite the Senate recommendation and SEC's own study, the SEC failed to issue any final rule to oversee credit rating agencies. The SEC failed to act and left the credit rating agencies 
completely unregulated until Congress finally passed a law in 2006. At tomorrow's hearing with Federal regulators, members will have a chance to ask the SEC Chairman Christopher Cox about his agency's record. Today our focus is on the credit rating agencies themselves, and members can question the CEOs of Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch about their performance. Running the credit rating agencies has been a lucrative occupation. Collectively, the three CEOs have made over $80 million. We appreciate that they have cooperated with the committee and look forward to their testimony. The story of the credit rating agencies is a story of a colossal failure. The credit rating agencies occupy a special place in our financial markets. Millions of investors rely on them for independent, objective assessments. The rating agencies broke this bond of trust, and Federal regulators ignored the warning signs and did nothing to protect the public. The result is that our entire financial system is now at risk, just as the CEO of Moody's predicted a year ago. I now want to recognize the, the Republican side for the opening statement. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm going to have Mr. Shays give it, but let me just make two comments. Number one, I associate myself with your remarks today. Thank you. And secondly, uh, we have a uh, letter uh, signed by all of our members on our side invoking our right to a day of testimony uh, by witnesses selected by the minority on matters we think should be included, and we look forward to working with you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shays. The letter will be part of the record. Mr. Chairman, when the referee is being paid by the players, no one should be surprised when the game spins out of control. That's what happened on Wall Street when credit rating agencies followed the delirious mob making millions on mortgage-backed securities and sold their independence to the highest bidder. As a result, investments once thought safe are being downgraded, some to no more than junk status. Trillions of dollars could vanish as asset redemptions calls for additional collateral, payments on derivative contracts and outright defaults unwind, sending unpredictable aftershocks into an already traumatized economy. It has been known for years the quants, quantitative analysis armed with cutting-edge software, real-time data and ultra-sophisticated algorithms were operating light years beyond regulators and credit evaluators using static econo econometric models. Esoteric investment products were structured to garner a triple-A grade by slicing and dicing risks into bits too small to register. Investors did not have enough information about the real value of the underlying assets or about how credit analysts reach their conclusions on the safety of their products being sold. Despite significant warning signs of a system under strain, data backing to the failure, uh, dating back to the failure of a large hedge fund long-term capital management in the late 1990s, Congress and the Securities Exchange Commission, SEC, were slow to recognize the peril posed by insensitive or financially compromised creditworthiness rating systems. Proposals to deconflict the interests of rating companies and their paymasters and to exact greater transparency and autonomy from the rating process came too little too late. So the con game continued, a scheme to engender and sustain a false sense of confidence in the improbable proposition housing prices would never fall. Like the Titanic, the good ship subprime was universally hailed as unsinkable. Succumbing to and profiting from the mass hysteria, rating agencies to stop looking for the icebergs always waiting in the world's financial sea lanes. Subjective judgments, perceptions of risk, and opinions on value obviously can't be regulated. But the rigor and consistency of the methodologies used and the validity of the data inputs relied upon can and should be 
far more transparent to investors and the SEC. Only that will rebuild genuine confidence in credit rating. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I am glad you agreed to hold a hearing on the role of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. While I understand your reluctance to probe politically volatile topics for both parties before the election, the planned November 20th hearing da date should give the Committee time to request documents and shine some much-needed sunlight onto the failed operations of the toxic twins of mortgage finance. The document requests have to include all records of lobbying contracts, lobbying expenditures, political action committee strategy, and contributions to various organizations, particularly those favored by members of Congress. It's past time for Fannie and Freddie to come clean about their reform avoidance activities and just as overdue that Congress confront its own role in coddling the arrogant authors of the housing finance crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shays. We will look forward to working with you on that issue. Before we uh, recognize Panel 1, I have a unanimous consent. Without objection, questioning for Panel 1 will proceed as follows. The majority and minority will each begin with a 10-minute block of time, with the Chairman and Ranking Member each having the right to reserve time for, uh, from this block for later use. And without objection, that will be the order. On Panel 1, we have Jerome Fawns, who is an economist who worked at Moody's Investor Service as a managing director until 2007. Frank Rader worked as a managing director for residential mortgage-backed securities at Standard & Poor's until 2005. And Sean Egan is the managing director of Egan Jones Ratings in Haverford, uh, Pennsylvania. We are pleased to welcome you to our committee. We appreciate your being here. It is the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath. So I would like to ask if you would please stand and raise your right hands. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The uh, record will show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your uh, prepared statements are, will be in the record in, in its entirety. We uh, would like to ask you to try to limit your oral presentations to around five minutes. We will have a clock uh, that, that will have green for four minutes, uh, orange for one minute, and then after five minutes it will turn red. When you see that it is red, we would like that to be a reminder that we would like you to sum up uh, the oral presentation uh, to us. Um, there is a button on the base of each mic, so be sure it is pressed in and close enough to you so that we can hear everything that you have to say. Mr. Fons, uh, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. Um, good morning. I am pleased to be invited to offer testimony on the state of the credit rating industry. Until August of 2007, I worked at Moody's Investors Service, where I had exposure to never, nearly every aspect of the ratings business. My last position at Moody's was Managing Director Credit Policy. I was a member of Moody's Credit Policy Committee and I chaired the firm's Fundamental Credit Committee. Prior to my 17 years at Moody's, I was an economist with the U.S. Federal Reserve and with Chemical Bank New York. Since leaving Moody's, I have been an independent consultant advising firms on rating agency issues. As this committee has heard before, the major rating agencies badly missed the impact of falling house prices and declining underwriting standards on subprime mortgages. Subprime residential mortgage-backed securities with initially high ratings found their way into nearly every corner of the financial system. Although evidence of falling home values began to emerge in late 2006, ratings did not reflect this development for some time. The first downgrades of subprime-linked securities occurred in June 2007. In short order, faith in credit ratings diminished to the point where financial institutions were unwilling to lend to one another. And so we had and are still having a credit crisis. Why did it take so long for the rating agencies to recognize the problem? Why were standards so low in the first place? And what should be done to see that this does not happen again? My view is that a large part of the blame can be placed on the inherent conflicts of interest found in the issuer pays business model and on rating shopping by issuers of structured securities. A drive to maintain or expand market share made the rating agencies willing participants in the shopping spree. Let me speak from my experience at Moody's. 
Moody's reputation for independent and accurate ratings sprang from a hard-headed culture of putting investors' interests first. Up until the late 1960s, the firm often refused to meet with rated companies. Even through the mid-1990s, long after the firm and its competitors began to charge issuers for ratings, Moody's was considered the most difficult firm on Wall Street to deal with. A 1994 article in Treasury and Risk Management magazine pointed to surveys that highlighted issuers' frustrations with Moody's. This had a profound impact on the firm's thinking. It raised questions about who our clients were and how best to deal with them. Management undertook a concerted effort to make the firm more issuer friendly. In my view, the focus of Moody's shifted from protecting investors to marketing ratings. The company began to emphasize customer service and commission detailed surveys of client attitudes. I believe the first evidence of this shift manifests itself in flawed ratings on large telecom firms during that industry's crisis in 2001. Following Moody's 2000 spin from Dun & Bradstreet, management's focus increasingly turned to maximizing revenues. Stock options and other incentives raised the possibility of large payoffs. Managers who were considered good businessmen and women, not necessarily the best analysts, rose through the ranks. Ultimately, this focus on the bottom line contributed to an atmosphere in which the aforementioned rating shopping could take hold. The so-called reforms announced to date are inadequate. While there are no easy fixes to the problems facing the rating industry, I will offer some suggestions. First, we need to see wholesale change at the governance and senior management levels of the large rating agencies. Managers associated with faulty structured finance ratings must also depart. New leadership must acknowledge the mistakes of the past and, and end the defense, defensive posture of denial brought on by litigation fears. Second, bond ratings must serve the potential buyer of the bond and no one else. That is, ratings must be correct today in the sense that, that a rating must be correct today in the sense that it fully reflects the views of the analyst or rating committee, with no attempts to stabilize ratings. A byproduct of this behavior will be that rating changes eventually lose their influence. Such a situation might arise sooner if regulators and legislators cease reliance on ratings. Elimination of the SEC's NRSRO designation will be a step in this direction. Also, regulators must drop restrictions on unsolicited ratings. This would help to minimize rating shopping and allow competition to yield positive benefits, such as lower cost and higher quality ratings. Going forward, structured finance rating practices must emphasize transparency and simplicity. Statistical, backward-looking rating methods need to be augmented with a strong dose of common sense. All rated structured transactions should be fully registered and subject to minimum, minimum disclosure requirements. The rating agencies need to implement concrete measures for taming the conflicts posed by the issuer pays business model. I do not believe that an investor pays model is the correct answer. There is a free rider problem with subscriber funded ratings, and most would agree that ratings should be freely available, particularly if they are referenced in regulations. It is not my intention to indict everyone working in the rating industry. Indeed, the analysts that I interacted with took the responsibility seriously and demonstrated high moral character. I was proud to be associated with Moody's, a feeling shared by many others at the firm, and I fervently believe that substantive reforms can restore the integrity and stature of the bond rating industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fons. Mr. Rader, I hear from you. Chairman Waxman and Ranking Member Davis, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this hearing today. <clears throat> My name is Frank Rader, and from March 1995 to April 2005, I was the Managing Director and Head of the Residential Mortgage-Backed Securities Ratings uh, Group at Standard & Poor's. I don't know if your mic is Do off I? or... Now? Mm -hmm. I was responsible for directing ratings, criteria development, ratings, production, marketing and business development for single family mortgage and home equity uh, loan bond ratings and related products. My tenure at S&P coincided with the rapid growth in mortgage securitization and development of new mortgage products, including subprime and expanded Alt-A products. During this period, total residential mortgage production in the United States grew from $639 billion in 1995 to $3.3 trillion in 2005. Subprime production grew from $35 billion to $807 billion over the same period. By regulation, institutional investment policy and tradition, the sale of associated mortgage-backed securities generally required ratings from two of the nationally recognized statistical rating organizations, or NRSROs. While a necessary player in the exploding market, the rating agencies were not the drivers of the train. The engine was powered by the low interest rates that prevailed after the turn of the century, the conductors were the lenders and the investment bankers who made the loans and packaged them into securities, 
and the rating agencies were the oilers who kept the wheels greased. I might add that the passengers on the train were the investors and it was standing room only. There's a lot of blame to go around. To appreciate the unique role that the rating agencies performed in the residential mortgage market, it is necessary to understand the ratings process. A mortgage-backed security consists of a pool of individual mortgage loans, and depending on the type of mortgage product, whether it's prime, subprime, alt A, whatever, an underlying given security could have as many as 1,000 to 25,000 loans in it. The ratings process consisted of two distinct operations, the credit analysis of the individual mortgages and a review of the documents governing the servicing of the loans and the payments to investors in the securities. The credit analysis is focused on determining the ex expected default probabilities on each loan and the loss that would occur in the event of default. In these, in turn, establish the expected loss that support the AAA bonds. In short, what the ratings process attempts to do is to find out what that equity piece is that needs to support the AAA bonds so that investor won't take any losses. It's very similar to the home equity you have in a home loan. That equity is intended to protect the uh, lender from taking a loss in the event of a change in circumstance. In 1995, S&P used a rules-based model for determining the loss expected on a given bond. Late that year, it was determined uh, and decided to move to a statistical-based approach, and we began gathering data to come out with a first uh, model that was based on approximately 500,000 loans with performance data going back five years. That version of the levels model, <coughs> excuse me, was implemented in 1996 and made available for purchase by originators, investment bankers, investors, and mortgage insurance companies. By making the model commercially available, S&P was committed to ma maintain parity between the model that they ran and the answers that were given to the investors and the issuers that purchased the model. In other words, S&P promised model clients that they would always get the same answers from the levels model that the rating agency got. Implicit in this promise was S&P's commitment to keep the model current. In fact, the original contract with the model consultant called for annual updates to the model based on a growing database. An update was accomplished in late 1998-1999 and that model was uh, ultimately released. The version uh, was built on 900,000 loans. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. We've developed two more iterations of the model, one with 2.5 million loans and one with 10 million loans. In a nutshell, those versions of the model were never released. While we had enjoyed substantial management support up to this time, by 2001, the stress for profits and the desire to keep expenses low prevented us from, in fact, developing and implementing the appropriate methodology to keep track of the new products. As a result, we didn't have the data going forward in 2004 and 5 to really track what was happening with the subprime products and some of the new uh, alternative payment type products. And we did not, therefore, have the ability to forecast when they started to go awry. As a result, we did not, uh, by that time, have the support of management in order to, impl to implement the analytics that, in my opinion, might have forestalled some of the problems that we are experiencing today. And with that, I'll end my remarks and be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Rader. We're going to have questions after uh, Mr. Egan for the three of you. Mr. Egan. Thank you. The current credit rating system is designed for failure, and that is exactly what we're experiencing. AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Countrywide, IndyMac, MBIA, AMBAC, the other monolines, Merrill Lynch, WAMU, Wachovia, and a string of structured finance securities all have failed or nearly failed to a great extent because of inaccurate, unsound ratings. Uh, the ratings of the three companies appearing before this committee today, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, were a major factor in the most extensive and possibly expensive financial calamity in recent American history. The IMF has estimated the financial loss from the current credit crisis at $1 trillion, but other estimates from knowledgeable sources have pegged it at twice that amount. 
Of course, there have been other contributing parties to this debacle, including some of the mortgage brokers, depository institutions, and investment banks. But there should be no doubt that none of this would have been possible were it not for the grossly inflated, unsound, and possibly fraudulent ratings provided to both the asset-backed securities directly issued as well as companies which dealt in these securities, whether it be originating, aggregating, financing, securitizing, insuring, credit enhancing, or ultimately purchasing them. Issuers paid huge amounts to these rating companies for not just significant rating fees, but in many cases very significant consulting fees for advising the issuers on how to structure the bonds to achieve a maximum AAA ratings. This egregious conflict of interest may be the single greatest cause of the present global economic crisis. This is an important point which is often overlooked in the effort to delimit the scope of the across-the-board failures of the major credit rating firms. This is not just a securitization problem. The, the credit rating industry is a five to six billion dollar market with these three companies, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, controlling more than 90 percent of the market. With enormous fees at stake, it is not hard to see how these companies may have been induced, at the very least, to gloss over the possibilities of default or, at the worst, knowingly provide inflated ratings. Again, the problems were not just in structured finance, but also the unsecured bonds and other plain vanilla debt offerings of many of the corporate entities participating in the mortgage market. These shortcomings, moreover, are nothing new. We have been here before, specifically in 2002 after Enron failed. Despite the fact that the major rating agencies had its debt at investment grade up through and including just before the company filed for bankruptcy protection. At Egan Jones, we downgraded Enron months before our competitors. In the case of WorldCom, it was about nine months before our competitors. In testimony at the time and before the Congress, we pointed out the inherent conflict of interest in the business model of the credit rating agencies which purport to issue ratings for the benefit of investors, but in fact are paid by the issuers of those securities. At a congressional hearing in 2003, I stated that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did not merit a AAA rating, which Moody's, S&P, and Fitch accorded to them. At about that time, we issued a rating call to the same effect with respect to MBIA, which our competitors rated AAA until just a few months ago. Currently, we rate MBIA and AMBAC uh, significantly in the, in the spec grade category. I think we're at about uh, triple, we're at about single B or below. How is it that the major rating agencies, which have approximately 400 employees for every analyst at Egan Jones, have been consistently wrong over such an extended period of time? I'd like to say that we have more sophisticated computer models or that our people are just plain better at what they do. I hope that some of that is true. But the real answer is that Egan Jones is in the business of issuing timely, accurate credit ratings, whereas Moody's, S&P, and Fitch have gravita gravitated to the much more lucrative business of expediting the issuance of securities. Investors want credible ratings. Issuers, on the other hand, want the highest rating possible since that reduces funding costs. Under the issuer paid business model, a rating agency which does not come in with the highest rating will, before long, be an unemployed rating firm. It's that simple and all, it's that simple, and all the explanations and excuses cannot refute this elementary truth. Let's go back to the Enron example. At the time, the major rating agencies rationalized this on the basis that there was fraud involved. We've heard that same thing to reflect the mortgage assets underlying the current crisis. Guess what? There may always be an element of fraud involved in the financial markets, and contrary to what you may hear from the other rating agencies, it is expressly the job of the rating agency to ferret out that fraud before providing an imprimatur upon which thousands of institutional investors and tens of thousands of individual investors have every reasonable expectation to rely on. It is, was not always this way. When John Moody founded the company, which still bears his name almost 100 years later, many of his colleagues on Wall Street urged him to keep the information to himself. He declined to do so, 
and instead opted for public dissemination used by and paid for by investors. The same history was true for S&P and Fitch until all three companies reversed their business model in the late 1970s and sought compensation from the issuers of the securities. The fact that this shift occurred contemporaneously with the rise of asset-backed financing is by no means a coincidence. Profits soared at these companies, but quality and independence moved increasingly inversely. In advocating the principle of returning the ratings industry to its roots, we have been told that the public policymakers, by the public policymakers, that they, in the Congress or the administrative agencies, should not be expected to choose among competing business models. We are at a loss to comprehend this hands off approach. If the business model currently utilized by Egan Jones and previously used by the, with great success by our competitors demonstrates it demonstrates a track record of serial failures with at least a trillion dollars of adverse financial consequences. Why is it not sufficient cause for the government to intervene? When the Congress was confronted with the safety record of the Corvair for, versus, for example, a Subaru or Volvo, the response was not laissez-faire. The Congress and the regulators indeed, even the auto industry itself, responded with corrective actions. For the rating agency, for the rating industry, the only real reform is to realign the incentives and get the industry back in the business of representing those who invest in securities, not those who issue them. Our written testimony includes a number of recommendations that would restore checks and balances to the rating system. But my main purpose in being here today is to highlight the nature of the problem and the need to address the root cause, not merely symptoms. Thank you for having me at this hearing and inviting Egan Jones to present testimony. I'd be pleased to address any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Egan. Uh, now, uh, pursuant to the unanimous consent re re uh, agreement, we'll start the questioning, 10 minutes on each side, and the chair yields five, of his, uh, time, five minutes of his time to uh, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony. Mr. Rader, you uh, explained that mortgage-backed securities are very complicated. We're all beginning to find that out, uh, that each one could contain uh, literally thousands of mortgages. And the way you explained in your testimony, you need a very sophisticated statistical modeling system to analyze all of these mortgages to see how likely it is that uh, each one or anyone might default. And things get even more complicated when we start talking about collateralized debt obligations, the securities that are constructed out of numerous asset-backed securities. Is that right? Well, the premise, as I understand it, and I was not in the CDO group, but the premise in the CDO uh, arena was by bundling a pool of bonds that had already been rated that what you were looking at predominantly was the diversity index between the performance of bonds in the residential market in a pool with bonds from the right, from but the these are these market. are very, obviously very sophisticated um, models that are needed to They're analyze. They're supposed them. to be. Right. So I want to show you a document that the uh, the committee obtained from S and P and get your reaction to it. This is not an email. This is uh, an instant message or a series of instant messages between two S&P officials who were chatting back and forth over the computer. It took place on the afternoon of April 5, 2007. And based on the document, we can identify the two employees as officials who work in the Structured Finance Division of S&P in New York City. So the Structured Finance Division would be the one that uh, analyzes these types, these complicated securities. That's correct. Okay. Um, as I show you, these, you'll see that what they're talking about, uh, they're talking about whether they should rate a certain deal. Here's what they said. Official number one, uh, by the way, that deal is ridiculous. Official number two, I know, right, model definitely does not capture half the risk. Uh, official number one, we should not be rating it. Official number two, we rate every deal. It could be structured by cows and we would rate it. Official number one, but there's a lot of risk associated with it. I personally don't feel comfy signing off as a committee member. Uh, this document is not testimony and it hasn't been prepared by an attorney and, uh, and vetted by the company. It's just two S&P officials sending messages to each other. But what they say is extremely disturbing. Their attitude seems to be casual acceptance that they rate deals that they should not be rating, that deals that are too risky. And they rate deals no matter how they're structured. 
So I'm, I want to ask you, what does the official mean when she says, quote, the model definitely does not capture half the risk? What is she referring to there? Well, again, I'm not an expert on the CDO uh, model or the methods that, that they use, but what I've read about it is it is tremendously driven by this diversity uh, index that's supposed to tell you whether the uh, bonds that are put in one of those transactions are correlated. So if one sector of the market starts to go down, whether that might have an impact on the performance of other bonds. As they started, in my opinion, putting more residential mortgage and consumer bonds in these transactions, they were highly correlated in our intuition. We weren't working on it, but it was highly correlated. And it kind of, um, I mean, it really amazed us that they could put so many mortgages in a pool and still believe that it had a diversification risk. But we were not part and parcel to those conversations. The only thing that I really got involved in was when I was requested to put these uh, ratings on transactions we hadn't seen and to basically guess as to what a rating might be. But, if, but to, I guess maybe to be put it more simply for lay people like us is if, they're, if, they're asse if somebody says that they're not assessing half the risk, uh, would that mean that um, somebody who was relying on the ratings to make an investment in those securities would not be getting an accurate picture of the risk that was involved? I would presume that's the, an interpretation. Which is the purpose of the ratings, correct? The purpose of the rating is to clearly and on a timely basis reflect what that risk is according to the experts at the rating agencies, and that rating apparently did not. Uh, the committee went back to investigate whether S&P had in fact uh, rated this particular deal, the one the instant message, uh, message discusses, and yesterday the SEC informed the committee that, uh, the committee staff, that it indeed had rated it. So I'm going to ask Mr. Egan, what do you think the official means when she says it could be structured by cows and we would rate it? Well, uh, uh, perhaps that cow is particularly talented. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what it means is that it, it, it's ridiculous that uh, that uh, the uh, uh, we have the approach uh, again. We step into the shoes of the investor. That if you don't understand it, if it's unsound, don't put your rating on it. There's no law that says that you have to rate everything. In fact, you can view the rating agencies as being similar to the meat inspectors. Um, if the uh, meat uh, is unsound, that, that it's tainted, the inspector has the obligation to stop the line and get rid of it or it threatens the whole system. Because what happens on the other end of the line, that is with investors, is they can't tell the difference between good meat and tainted meat. You know, the investors don't have access to all the information. They don't have the expertise. They're relying on it, it, hopefully an independent agent and that's, that's the crux of the problem, the independence. Um, to stop things from coming down the line. In fact, I would argue that it's uh, that the Fed's and Treasury's actions are going to have less and less impact because it's not solving the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that ratings link up providers of capital and 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 uh, was it users of capital. And if that linkage is is broken, which is what has happened uh, right now you're not going to have people coming into the market. They don't trust it. They won't eat the meat if it is tainted and we have a breakdown in the system, despite probably about $3 trillion worth of support for the, the financial system. Thank you for using the beef metaphor for the, <laughs> the cow question. Thank you, Mr. Yarmuth. The chair reserves the uh, balance of his time and now uh, turns to Mr. Davis for 10 minutes. Yeah, I, think, I think you milked that uh, pun for all you could do. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a couple of questions. First of all, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I think it has been very helpful to both sides. On the next panel, we are going to hear from senior executives that acknowledge that the assumptions that S&P used to estimate the risk of subprime mortgage default in order to produce ratings of mortgage-backed securities between 2005 and 2007 were wrong. Is it simply, my, my question to each of you is, is it simply the case they got the assumptions wrong? Or do you think there is more to the story that maybe they aren't willing to share with us? So I just throw out a couple. Their clients, when you say who were their clients, really wasn't the general public, was it? It was the securities they were rating and it was their shareholders. And they were real happy with these uh, 
I mean, is, isn't that the underlying problem? I just start with you, Mr. Regan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're a manager of a public company, your job is to enhance the value of that company as much as possible. And the, uh, pro the, the providers of 95 percent, between 90 and 95 percent of the revenues of S&P and Moody's and Fitch happen to be the issuers. And uh, the other oddity, and we look at industries all the time, you'll never find an industry like the, the credit rating industry. It's uh, the Justice Department uh, used the term partner monopoly, and that, that's a, a fair term. Uh, the problem is that there's no downside for being wrong, okay? In our case, we're paid solely by the institutional investor. If we're wrong, we lose clients. Okay, so our job is to get to the truth quickly. We're sort of like a bank. In the old business model, if you went to a bank, let's say 15 years ago, you wanted a mortgage, you go to the bank, the bank would assess, the banking officer along with the credit officer would assess your ability to repay the loan and then it would go up to the head of the credit committee and then it would go to the uh, state or federal bank examiner. So you had three checks. The goal is to make sure that the credit was assessed properly. You don't want to be too tight or you won't do enough, you won't do any business, and you don't want to be too loose, so you have garbage in the portfolio. That system has been thrown out the door to one whereby everybody involved in the process has an incentive for, you know, for letting things go by, basically. From the mortgage broker, the mortgage banker, the investment bank, the issuer paid rating firm, they all get paid if a deal happens and they don't get paid if a deal doesn't happen. In the case of the rating firms, if S&P decides or Moody's decides to tighten up their standards, S&P and Moody's will take the transaction. And so it's very easy to just go along with the flow because the downside is very limited. You can't be sued effectively. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I mean, the real question is, um, I understand where the incentives were. What's your ethical obligation? Is it to your clients and your shareholders that are putting you up or is it to uh, the public? They serve two masters, uh, and the most important master is one who pays the freight, which happens to be the issuers. In our case, it's the institutional investors. We get, you know, you know our business has grown over the past uh, a year because we've warned people about the disasters coming down the pipe. We got a lot of grief for it because people thought we were wrong. But no, we warn about the monolines and the broker dealers and a series of others. So our interests are aligned with the ultimate holders of these securities. Yeah, Mr. Bader, Mr. Fonz, you want to make any comment on it? And you, you sat down there trying to make the right decisions. You didn't have the pressures, I guess, that they felt above to make profits and to. Um, well, I believe that Standard Poor's at this time. Yeah, be sure to press your button on the mic. The Standard Poor's at this time, there was a raging debate between the business managers and the analysts. The analysts were, were in the trenches. We saw the transactions coming in. We could see the, the shifts that were taking place in the collateral. <clears throat> and we were asking for more staff and more investment in being able to build the databases and the models that would allow us to track what was going on. It, the uh, corporation, on the other hand, was interested in trying to maximize the money that was being sent up to McGraw-Hill, and the requests were routinely denied. So by 2005, when I retired, we did have two very excellent models that were developed but not implemented. And it's my opinion that had we built the databases and been allowed to run those models and continuously uh, populate that base and do the analysis on a monthly, quarterly basis, we would have identified the problems as they occurred. Another big area that uh, Mr. Egan has discussed is there's two sides to the rating. You have an initial rating when the bonds are uh, sold, and then you have surveillance. And at some point uh, in the uh, mid-1990s, the management of Standard & Poor's decided to make surveillance a profit center instead of an adjunct critical key uh, part of keeping investors informed as to how their investments were performing after they bought the bonds. And as a result, they didn't have the staff or the information they didn't even run the ratings model in the surveillance area, which would have allowed them to have basically re-rated every deal S&P had rated to that time and see exactly what was going on and whether the support was there for those AAA bonds. The, the uh, reason they gave for not doing it was because they were concerned that the ratings would get volatile and people would start to feel like all AAAs aren't the same. And it was a much more pragmatic business decision than really focusing on 
how to protect the franchise and the reputation by doing the right thing for the investors. Okay. As Mr. Jones's point and Mr. Regan's pointed out, we weren't paid by the investors, but we certainly, at the ratings level, pitched them because we would say in our presentations, if S&P isn't on a transaction, you ought to ask why. And we would do the same thing uh, in presentations that we shared jointly with Moody's analysts. We would always tell the investors, you guys are driving this big market and you're not doing your homework. You're buying everything that's coming out the chute and you need to spend a little more time on your own analysis and review. Yeah. Nobody looked under the hood. Yeah. But to set the record straight, the, the large rating agencies do take some fees from investors. They have investor, so-called investor clients. They market services in terms of their research service and other things. So there is some focus there. But as I said in my testimony, well, and as, as Mr. Rader just mentioned, the franchise derives from the reputation that the firms have. And that comes from serving the, the, the ultimate client, and that is the investor, particularly the investor who hasn't bought a bond yet, who is considering a purchase of a security. And that was really what was betrayed here, isn't it? Well, that, that was the original, that's what led to the, that focus led to the, uh, the rise in the reputations that helped build the franchise that eventually they, they saw as a cash cow and they wanted to milk and, um, and start serving many masters, as we said, and you can't do that. Okay, thank you. Reserve the balance. Someone reserves the balance of his time. Ms. Maloney? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank the panelists today. Uh, Mr. Egan, in your testimony, you basically said these credit rating agencies were the, the gatekeepers. They rated these very complex uh, products, the derivatives, the mortgage-backed securities on which investors and I would say the entire economy uh, relied. I, I've got to say that it's important to note that the President's working group has said that the credit rating agencies contributed substantially to the present financial crisis by their failure to warn investors of the recent wave of credit defaults and institutional failures. I, I would like to uh, begin with you, Mr. Fons, and look at uh, how aware these credit rating agencies were of the risk that was out there. And I want to ask you about a, a presentation prepared by Moody's CEO, Raymond McDaniel. This presentation was prepared for a meeting of Moody's Board of Directors on October 25, 2007, when the company was coming to grips with its role in the subprime debacle. The document, in my opinion, is an exceptionally candid internal assessment of what went wrong at Moody's. Its title is, Credit Policy Issues at Moody's Suggested by the Subprime Liquidity Crisis, and it is marked confidential and proprietary. Under the heading Conflicts of Interest, Market Share, the document says, and I quote, the real problem is not that the market underweights ratings quality, but rather that in some sectors it actually penalizes quality. It turns out that ratings, qualify, that ratings quality has surprisingly few friends. Issuers want high ratings. Investors don't want ratings downgrade. Short-sighted bankers labor short-sightedly to game the ratings agencies. And uh, Mr. Fons, and that's the end of the quote. Mr. Fons, you used to work at Moody's. Uh, this document appears to contradict uh, years of uh, public statements by Mr. McDaniel and other Moody's officials that they are not pressured by the issuers. And I'd like to ask you, Mr. Fons, are you surprised uh, by, by, by this kind of uh, assessment uh, that Mr. McDaniel would be making uh, to, the, to his board of directors? Um. No, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, this totally reflected my views and the views of many others at the firm. Many, of course, didn't want to hear this. Um, one problem with this whole statement is that the emphasis is on rating quality. And in my view, that is something that has never really been clearly articulated by the ratings agencies or by regulators or by anybody else. We talk about ratings quality, but there is no clear definition of what that means. And, and, and without a, a firm target there, um, we don't have much to go on, but clearly what he's referring to is accurate ratings here, and and it is, and um, we we definitely knew that um, that the investors were conflicted in what they wanted, 
um, in terms of having stable ratings on bonds once they held them, um, that issuers were conflicted and that they wanted high ratings on their securities, whether or not they deserved them, and that uh, bankers um, were taking advantage of the competition in the rating industry to game the system. Let, let me read a, another um, quote from this document. Mr. McDaniel further writes, and I quote, unchecked competition on this basis can place the entire financial system at risk, end quote. It appears he was correct knowing back in 2007 their failure to act put our entire financial system at risk. And are you surprised by this statement? What is your comment on this statement? Well, it's, at that point it was too late to do anything. Um, it was clear the ratings were wrong. It was clear at that point that um, the uh, securities that had faulty ratings had already permeated the entire financial system and many of these uh, other institutions were unwitting victims, um, including the monoline insurers, including the banks, including um, uh, uh, insurance companies and, and others. So I, I think um, th this is not surprising and I, I believe he, he, it was prescient. In this statement, Mr. McDaniel describes how Moody's has addressed the tension between satisfying the investment banks and providing honest ratings, and I quote, Moody's for years has struggled with this dilemma. On the one hand, we need to win the business and maintain market share, or we cease to be relevant. On the other hand, our reputation depends on maintaining ratings quality. He describes some of the steps that Moody's has taken to, and I quote, square the circle, end quote. But he then says, and I quote, this does not solve the problem. I, I would like uh, permission, sir, to put this in the record. And uh, without objection, and, and, and what is your views on this statement, Mr. Fons? And I, I welcome Mr. Egan and Mr. Reitner to make comments likewise. Um, I, I think General Lady's time has expired, but we'll okay. allow you the time to answer. Um, I, I believe he hit the nail on the head. It is a, it's, it's a difficult problem and it, we don't see an easy answer. It, it, in our view, it's not a, it's not a difficult problem. It's, in fact, it's very simple. This, they, uh, go back to a model that has worked from, actually from biblical times, and that <laughs> is you want an alignment uh, between the ultimate holder of these assets and whoever is assessing them. If you have that, a lot of problems will fall away. You wouldn't have people, uh, you know, uh, taking out mortgages that they had little chance of, uh, of paying back. But you want to focus on the right thing. Some people say it's a subprime uh, crisis or an alte or, or whatever. No, our view is that it's really an industry problem. It's a regulatory problem. Uh, we use the analogy of a 90-year-old man that had a triple bypass operation. There's no reason that that person shouldn't be allowed to get insurance. Just like the you know, uh, subprime mortgages have a legitimate purpose, alte mortgages have a legitimate purpose, but Back to the 90-year-old uh, the, the man who wants to get uh, insurance, just make sure that the risk is properly assessed, okay, that he's charged appropriately for that. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Mr. Issa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, 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 would, I would hope we are not talking about uh, dental insurance here for that 90-year-old <laughs> gentleman. Uh, but uh, I understand the risk assessment. Let's go through a couple of things. Uh, I think up here on the dais, we, we realize that there's been, there's been an aircraft crash and, you know, there's probably a pilot that didn't do the right thing, a mechanic that didn't do the right thing, uh, maybe Boeing didn't do the right thing, and you go through and you say, okay, the plane fell out of the sky because everyone messed up. Uh, what we're trying to do, I hope here, and what we're hoping you'll help us with, is assess uh, how to keep Congress from doing the two things we do so well, which is nothing at all and overreact. And it's the latter that I'm concerned about. And I, Mr. Egan, I want to follow up on something that is the premise of your testimony, I believe, and that is that whose bread thy eat, whose praise thy sing, period. And that's, I think, what I heard is that, uh, that inherently you give an honest answer to your client, but you're also skewed that way, that, that the rating agencies taking money from the people selling the instruments was a conflict. Is that roughly loose sense correct? It is a conflict, okay. yes. Well, let me, An unmanageable let me, conflict, too. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's go through a couple of things, because I, I want to judge how much of a conflict. PricewaterhouseCoopers rates a public company, 
in their audit, right? Yes. They are paid by the company they are auditing. Do they give an audit? It's an independent audit. Right. Okay. I mean, there is an assumption they do. If they don't, then the entire audit system falls apart. Uh, CEO of a public company under Sarbanes-Oxley signs saying I am telling the truth about the condition of my company on that report that is prepared by the public accounting firm but has his signature. Generally truthful, right? Right. Held to be truthful. We rely on it. Yes. Uh, if you are an ISO 9001 manufacturer, you pay people to say whether your quality manufacturing system is in fact credible and they rate you for whether you meet that, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Goldman Sachs takes a company public, uh, takes their stock and sells it. Ultimately, Goldman Sachs makes a fortune on it, but isn't there an essential belief that they are bringing it to market? Well, they are making a lot of money, but they are bringing it to market at a par relatively par level, and historically, isn't that relatively true? Yes. Okay. So my premise to you is, since we rely on all of these in the system and all of these are paid for by the person who in a sense gets rated, might I might not ask the question this way. The subprime loans were essentially the equivalent of taking the Dow Jones Industrial Average, having no equity in it, as, and then having no margin call but saying it is AAA rated. If I put a package together of the S&P 500 today and I took one of each of those stocks, I put it in there and I sold it as a package and Moody's underwrote it as AAA, but it had no equity in it because the, and, it, and it had no stated of my income and it had no recourse, wouldn't in a sense that be closer to what these packages were where you had a liar's loan, no, no down payment, and the only way the loans were going to get paid back was A, they had to stay the same or go up, and in some cases, if they didn't go up, the people couldn't have made the payments anyway, and yet they got a high rating. Isn't it the fundamental actual underpinning of these documents that should never have gotten a AAA rating, uh, separate from the question of conflict? No. Okay. Let me explain. Let, let's go through that. Uh, let me. Is this, no, I, I have very okay. limited time, so I, I want you to answer, but I want to pose it in a way that you can answer it, I think, consistently. Mr. Fons also wants to. Were there subprime loans in which the substantial portion of the package had little or no down payment? Yes. Okay. Were these, in most cases, people who, in retrospect, were unlikely to be able to make those payments with their current income if it stayed the same? Yes. And by definition, the economy has rises and falls, and real estate goes both directions, up or down. Isn't that true? Sure, yes. So how do you put a AAA rating knowing that if that happens, these cannot, in fact, be repaid in full or even close to it? The core problem in the case of the mortgage-backed securities was that the assumption was that housing prices would in, increase. In fact, they embed it in uh, an acronym. What is it? The, uh, uh, the, the house appreciation rate, uh, which is somewhat ironic because it doesn't ac account for the fact that sometimes housing is uh, deflate, you know, uh, decline. Um, you brought up a lot of very good examples, but there is a distinction between the examples you gave and the rating industry. In the case of the Price Waterhouse, okay, uh, accounting firms are sued and successfully sued if they are substantially wrong. In the case of the rating industry, the, the, the uh, current practice is that ratings are opinions. And we agree with that because ultimately we are not guaranteeing all the securities. There is just too much out there. The industry would go away if there is a forced, uh, you know, they, they, if you did away with the freedom of speech defense. Um, in the case of the, uh, the accounting industry, Arthur Anderson said, well, we would never allow these, this nonsense to happen because our reputation is too important. Well, guess what? On an individual uh, basis, they obviously did bend their standards with Enron and WorldCom and the others. You mentioned the um, uh, Goldman Sachs and other underwriters. Sometimes they have liability. In fact, in the case of WorldCom, 
they, the underwriters for, I think it was about $11 billion worth of debt that WorldCom issued about 10 months before bankruptcy, they had to pay $12 billion. So there are checks and balances. Uh, it's rare that the rating firms have to pay anything for their inaccuracies. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. I, I think Gentlemen's the word time. recourse has come out of uh, uh, this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rader, um, Devin Sharma, the President of Standard & Poor's, is going to probably sit in the seat you are sitting in in a few minutes. And one of the things that he is going to say is that uh, they received inaccurate information and therefore had no duty to look at the individual mortgages. And one of the things I think that concerns the American people is how it seems that everybody is passing the buck, passing the blame. and Nobody seems to want to take responsibility for this phenomenal fiasco. So I want to ask you uh, and, and you and other panel members about a particularly complex type of financial product, a CDO squared. A CDO squared is created when CDOs are constructed from pools of securities issued by other CDOs. They are also sometimes called synthetic CDOs because they can be backed by no actual mortgages. The complexity of these instruments can be simply staggering. Let me show you an email exchange between three analysts at S&P that took place on December 15, 2006. They are trying to figure out if the rating they are giving a CDO squared is justified. In this first email, an analyst named Chris Meyer says he is worried about the CDO of CDO problems. And this is what he writes. Doesn't it make sense that a, a triple B synthetic would likely have a zero recovery in a triple A scenario? If we ran the recovery model with the triple A recoveries, it stands to reason that the tranche would fail since there would be lower recoveries and, and presumably a higher degree of defaults. Now, Mr. Myers then writes, Rating, quote, rating agencies continue to create an even bigger monster, the CDO market. Let's hope, and this is, this, is, this is striking, it says, let's hope we are all wealthy and retired by the time this house of cards falters. Now, Mr. Rader, I know you usually rated mortgage-backed securities and not CDOs, but this is a striking statement for an S&P analyst to make. What do you think uh, Mr. Meyer meant when he called the CDO market a house of cards? And this would seem to almost go directly uh, against what Mr. Sharma has written in his written testimony uh, that there was certain uh, that they had come to a point where they didn't have uh, information and therefore they had no obligation and therefore let the, let the buck pass to somebody else. Do you have a re response? <coughs> Well, my short response is Mr. Sharma wasn't there at the time. So if somebody else wrote his... Uh, well, he's giving... Response. What he's done is he's talked about what has happened right. over, the, over that time. I don't believe that they didn't have the information. I believe that it was available on both the residential side and on the CDO side. I think there was a, a breakdown in the analytics that they relied on and that uh, the House of Cards intuitively to a lot of us uh, analysts that were outside the CDO area but were looking at it through the glass, intuitively it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And as Mr. Uh, Egan has suggested, we were all relatively uh, well-educated and intelligent people and if you couldn't explain it to us, we were real curious how this product was enjoying such a tremendous success. And unfortunately, anecdotally, we were told that it was enjoying a lot of success because they were selling these bonds in Europe and Asia and not in the United States, particularly the lower rated pieces. It sounds like Mr. Egan and you and, and perhaps Mr. Fine uh, believe as uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, Mr. Krugman believes is that there may have been some fraud here. Well, there's all, I will use fraud, sir. I would suggest that there became a tremendous disconnect between the business managers at uh, our firm that were trying to maximize McGraw-Hill's share price. Well, clearly there was, well, do you believe there was greed? 
Uh, I think that there was. A, a, a look at the definition of fraud. Uh, you know, when you have the uh, when you hurt somebody and you do it willing willingly, then it is fraud. And in the case, it, I'm relying on the information uh, provided by the Financial Times. Moody's. Uh, knew there was problems with the model and withheld that information because they didn't want to move off of the, uh, the AAA. They hurt investors in the process. They knew they were hurting investors if the information in the Financial Times uh, that uh, reported was accurate. So, yes, another comment on fraud. Yes, what? That it meets the normal definition. You have to do additional a fraud. A fraud. Yes, exactly. You have to do some additional investigation. But if the Financial Times is right, yes, there is fraud. Also, in terms of fraud in the underlying securities, uh, I stated in connection with the Enron and WorldCom hearing that there is always fraud connected with financial matters where uh, people, where firms are, are failing. It's normal, okay? It's normal for the WorldCom executives to say everything is fine, don't worry about it, but yet it's the job of the credit rating firm to assess that and to get to the truth. And that's where the alignment of interest is absolutely critical. If you don't have that, you have a breakdown in the system, and that's exactly what we have right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Before I recognize the next question, I want to ask unanimous consent to allow all documents referred to in statements and questions throughout this hearing to be part of the record. Without objection, that will be the order. Um, Mr. Bilbrey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the panel for being here. Um, and I really want to say, Mr. Egan, thank you for saying bluntly what a lot of people have been thinking, wanting to have open and saying, look, this thing has reached the point to where there's really no reasonable way to say that it hasn't crossed fraud. Now, how much over? We could say, who would have thought that real estate would ever go down in this illusionary time? But reasonable people should have if that's what they were, you know, that's the difference between the expert and the general public, supposedly. Um, you know, do you think the, the rate shopping played a major role um, in this crisis? Absolutely. And that, would you say that that rate shopping um, and the way it was done would be defined to reasonable people as, um, as fraud instead of just a normal business cycle? Well, it's incremental, so it's harder. Yeah, it's harder to throw it in, in. In my opinion, it's harder to throw it into the category. It ultimately reached that level where you're hurting the public. You knew that you're hurting the public, and yet, as a uh, 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 a firm, a publicly held rating firm, you, you're pressured into it. Um, but I think it, there's a deeper problem, and the deeper problem is, you know, addressing the question: Well, why is the rating shopping? Why, uh, uh, you know, why can issuers go from one firm to the other firm to the other firm and and get the highest rating? And there's relatively little downside for the rating uh, for the rating firm because they have the freedom of speech defense. I think you have to step back and say, well, we, how do we fix this? And I think you can fix it from the in institutional investor standpoint, which also will trickle down to the individual. The institutional investor should know darn well that these ratings are paid for by the issuers, you know, 90 to 95 percent. So why in the world do they have all their investment guidelines geared to conflicted ratings? You know, that they, they should make the adjustment because it's a fool's errand to try and rein in the, the activities of S&P and Moody's. It won't happen because there will be, over the long term, because there's a natural tendency to serve their masters. That is the issuers. And, see, see and that the, following your analogy, your analogy to the meat inspector, the fact that if the meat inspector gets paid per um, side of beef that's approved, yes. there's an inherent conflict um, with him finding the tainted meat and throwing it off the line because they get paid less. Absolutely, money. yes. And I guess that's, that's the analogy you work on. The other analogy you use, that, and, and you know, St. Augustine teaches us that when we want to find fault, we should start looking at what we're not doing properly. Sure. I think the analogy you use of the elderly man getting a triple bypass needs to be required to pay more because there's more risk there. Yes. And that that more is not punitive. It is just common sense, and it's punitive. I mean, it's not punitive, but it, but but it's prudent. That's right. It's sustainable. You know, I you could set up a firm to just insure those. Uh, Mr. People. Egan, you realize that the, in this town, in Congress, they would call you mean-spirited, and that that attitude picks on those who can at least afford to pay on that. Now, I'll give you an example. We got the same thing here. We were talking about. I have to assume 
that the degree of, of um, subprime loan, um, the, the general population that received those subprime loans tended to be in the lower social economic rating, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes. Okay, now in this town, you start requiring those people to care more of the burden of insuring their loan. There are a lot of people here that would be the first ones to attack you for doing that because you're targeting those who could pay the least. There's a place for public policy interests and there's a place for uh, good business decisions. We're in the uh, business, our job is to protect investors and wow. everything is geared towards that. And I, I understand that and I'll just tell you something. Um, there are a lot of people in this town um, on our side of the dais who would love to turn every program into a welfare program, be it loans, be it, be it tax system, be it everything else. And then when the system starts crumbling because it cannot maintain itself, it's the little guy who gets hurt the worst in these crises. And I wish we'd remember that when we mean to help the little guy, we actually can do damage. Absolutely. And the case, uh, one case in point is the commercial paper crisis. Um, it might be that GE is helped out because it's a large, important issuer. But what about the secondary and tertiary issuers of commercial paper? That's why we encourage a return to a sustainable system. The government can't, the Fed and the Treasury can't issue a new program every week and hope to save the market. What's needed is a return to the, the, the policies that have worked over time, and that is the uh, basically checks and balances, two forms of ID, make sure that the credit quality is properly assessed so that the money will flow in, so that French Treasurer, who is burnt because he invested in AAA, Rhine Bridge, and Automall is rated AAA and was slammed down to D in a period of two days will come back in the market after there are some checks and balances reinstalled. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fonds, uh, did you write a white paper on rating competition and structured finance? I did. And in that paper, uh, did you say that uh, recent rating mistakes, while undoubtedly harming reputations, have not materially hurt the rating agencies. On the contrary, rating mistakes have in many cases been accompanied by an increase in the demand for rating services. Did you say that? Yes. And, and so we have a situation where uh, the rating services uh, are actually profiting even though their ratings uh, may not, in fact, have been accurate. Is that correct? Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of the committee, look at this system. Investment banks need high ratings. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, need lucrative fees from the investment banks. Investment banks get the ratings. Moody's gets the fees. We know what the investors get. And we know what the taxpayers get. Now, Mr. Fonz, uh, we have a document here called Ratings Erosion by Persuasion, so 2007, October. It's a confidential presentation that was prepared for the company's board of directors at Moody's. Uh, I want to read you one part of the section. It says, analysts and managing directors are continually pitched by bankers, issuers, investors, all with reasonable arguments whose views can color credit judgment, sometimes improving it, other times degrading it. Uh, we drink the Kool-Aid. What does that mean? I think um, it's human nature to be swayed to some extent by the people you interact with and they are being pressured, um, they're being pitched because their ratings are important, their, their ratings carry weight in the market or at least they had at that time and um, you know they, were, they had a lot of incentives to listen to these people. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to submit for the record from the Oxford Dictionary of American Political Slang, uh, drink the Kool-Aid to commit to or agree with a person, a course of action, etc. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fonz. Did Moody's offer a German insurance corporation, Hanover, to rate its credit? Do you have any knowledge of that? I'm not sure, no. I, I don't know exactly what happened there. Could you provide to this uh, committee the answer to this question? whether or not Moody's offered to rate Hanover's credit and when Hanover refused, whether it uh, gave it an adverse rating. And I'm raising this question, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for this reason. 
On January 10th, the same day that you wrote your uh, article, uh, according to uh, Alex Coburn in, in Counterpunch, he said that uh, Moody's gave the U.S. government a AAA credit rating. Uh, but while it was giving the U.S. government a AAA credit rating, it said, uh, according to this uh, report, that in the very long term, the rating could come under pressure if reform of Medicare and Social Security is not carried out, as these two programs are the largest threats to the long-term financial health of the United States and to the government's AAA rating. Are you familiar with that report? I, I didn't read that, no. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to submit this for the record, Mr. Uh, Chairman, because we know that Wall Street has been trying to grab Social Security forever. Imagine, Mr. Chairman, if we had gone along with these privatization schemes and all the people on pension in the United States lost, lost their Social Security benefits because the market crashed. Here we have Moody's, according to this article, Moody's is involved in promoting not only privatization of Social Security, but privatization of Medicare. They privatize Medicare, the insurance companies, Moody's rates, can make more money. You privatize Social Security, Wall Street investors make a windfall. Now, this racket, known as ratings, uh, has uh, uh, not just a, uh, a whiff of fraud, has been pointed out by Mr. Cummings in a conversation with my friend Mr. Tierney, but here, if the investment banks are paying to get a form of, of a, uh, to get a form of a high rating, that's, that's kind, of, it's kind of extortion. If they pay to make sure, can they also pay to make sure their competitors get low ratings, which would be a type of bribery? Uh, could, um, if Moody's could essentially offer credit to, to rate someone, and then if they don't accept the rating, give them an adverse credit, uh, that's a form of a racket. And uh, if they could go to the U.S. government and tell the U.S. government, either you uh, uh, go along with privatization of Social Security and, and Medicare, we're going to downgrade your, your rating. I mean, this is criminal. Mr. Egan, would you like to comment on that? Um, you have a current example of that, that process whereby reportedly uh, S&P and Moody's went to the monoline insurance companies, the AMBACs and the MBIAs, and said uh, they were at that time involved only in municipal finance, and said that if you don't get involved in structured finance, we're going to have to take a negative action on you because your, your funding sources aren't sufficiently diversified. Okay. A uh, core aspect is, do they really believe it or do, were they pressuring them to bolster the structured finance market? Don't know, but the, your, your, your point is well taken that they can abuse the power that they have. And by the way, the best source of information on uh, Hanover uh, reinsurance is an article by Al Klein in the Washington Post. It's probably about uh, two and a half years ago. And th there's a subtlety, because this came up when I testified in front of the Senate Banking Committee. The subtlety was that Moody's was providing a rating for Hanover Re, but is looking for additional compensation on another form of rating. I think they're for a rating there, uh, uh, was it their insurance? Uh, side, but they wanted to be uh, rated, I believe, they wanted to be paid for the rating on the debt side. And so the answer came, uh, Moody's answer is that, well, we're already being paid, but that was, there's a, the new the response was a little bit more nuanced than that. They wanted to get paid on the more lucrative part, the more, they wanted to have a more extensive relationship, and according to uh, Al Klein's uh, story, they took negative actions while S&P and I think it was AM Best did not. Uh, at the time. So the, the basically the opportunity, the means for mischief is there. And that's why we press that there at least be one rating that has the interest of the investors at heart because you could check these things. You could say, hey, wait a second, this is a real credit rating and forget about this nonsense that's going on. Well, thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Time has expired. Mr. Souter. All of us are really crashing and, and learning as much as we can about the finances. And I come, and every time I think uh, I can get into a couple of particular questions that I want to, but it, it's just, some of the answers just appall me. I mean, it, it's clear that greed led to not only see no evil, hear no evil, but report no evil. That uh, it's clear that there was uh, fraud here, but there's also, to me, incredible gross incompetence. It's an embarrassment 
to the business profession to have business people stand up here and even some of you who have been warning to make some of the statements you have made in front of these hearings that, for example, uh, Mr. Uh, Rader, you said we didn't, ha didn't have the ability to forecast when these were going awry. You also said there was a breakdown in fundamental uh, analysis. My, my background by training is, is business management uh, to, so, and, and spent two years in a case program where you basically analyze what's the core source problem, what's the secondary problems, what's the tertiary, how do, you, how do you do this and you wake up at night and basically everything for the rest of your life you're tearing it apart in that system. This just screams out in 60 minutes of analyzing what happens certain base management things that were not done. Um, that, that if you have basic mortgages, you come out and, and start to try to separate these into to no risk mortgages, then you come down to a six pack of, of, of derivatives with some toxic things inside that, then you do another derivative package off of that, then you do another derivative off of that. Number one management theory is if you're building a house like this, every level you go, you should be drilling down where the foundation is, know every variation in that foundation because you built an entire system of ratings and everything else on a foundation that requires increasing scrutiny, not we don't quite know this, uh, I wonder how we're going to do this and so on. Basic core management. If you say you're a business exec, you would be crawling all over the specifics of that. Then guess what? Because these new vehicles came that were supposedly, quote, risk-free, now out three and four levels, some without even a mortgage behind it, demand came. It was no secret that whether it was political driving on Fannie Mae, whatever, part of this was demand for everybody who wanted higher returns to go get these packages. So we have an artificial doubling of the housing market without anybody asking, where are these coming from? Where did all these new people come to get these homes? Who was building this foundation? Now, yes, some of it's a conflict of interest. It's clear that when temptation was there, the conflict of interest uh, came in. But the core problem is we have this in multiple categories in the financial, and not all of them had conflicts of interest. We have a conflict of interest here, but we also have a core problem founded in what were the bond rating managers doing? You could tell from the change in the market. You could tell that wh why are some of these yielding so much? Guess what? They're yielding more because they're getting charged more points. They're having to pay higher interest rates. Any manager, any manager looking at that should have said, these are higher risk. What are we getting here? Where? How, ca how can you say that this wasn't predictable? Well, uh, all you, every, the, the things were all there. And they were given the bond. In our opinion, it's not, by the way, incompetence. Uh, I, I, if you look, if the job of a, a manager of a public company is to increase the revenues, increase the profitability, you probably would come to the conclusion that they did everything possible I, uh, to I, do I that. Under, I understand but, your But there's you're, a conflict you're between. Making, you're making an ethical argument yeah. that uh, it, I would argue that that presumes that they actually knew the danger rather than they were just trying to do. I believe there is possible legal culpability because, in fact, another thing that w was stated here that, that um, there were, uh, that, in multiple of the memos, but in the, that, that I think Mr. Rader said that the question was is did we want to come up with two categories of AAA bonds because some of these were more uh, risky? Yes. That is an ethical obligation. It's probably a legal obligation that if there were inside AAA bonds some things that didn't really have the criteria that is the public definition of a AAA bond, there should have been a, a, another category because that suggests that management actually knew. Now, I understand your point. Their goal is to maximize revenue if you take that model. But by the way, in agriculture, agriculture does fund some of the expectors. But the reason they don't have a conflict of interest as they know if there's tainted meat or tainted chicken or anything like that, their entire category goes under. Nobody will buy their meat as in mad cows and that there can be a conflict of interest and, and still, in fact, maintain inspectors. The problem is if they're incompetent and greedy and corrupt and behaving illegal, then the conflict of interest pushes them over the top and they destroy their industry, which is what happened here. It has not happened in agriculture. The, the examples that were being used in agriculture are, are wrong. 
Can I address that since it's my example? Um, I, I, I think that um, it, you have, in economics, this is uh, from going back 20 years, there's what's called the tragedy of the commons. And that is that if you have a, 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 a town uh, in the 1700s, you let people put the cow on the commons to graze. And the, the problem comes in when everybody puts their cow, then the commons deteriorates and it doesn't support any of the cows. Uh, and so there's a delay in the reaction. Did uh, the investment banks, uh, did they want to see, uh, the, did the industry want to see three of the five investment banks disappear? No. But it, the decision isn't being made on that level. It's being made on the individual level, just like the cow example. Okay, we want to get this deal through. We want to get the lowest possible issuance costs. Let's do what we can to do it. And it's just, uh, I, I think this breakdown surprised a lot of people in the industry, the finance sector. But here we are. And so you have to step back and say, you know, what is the underlying cause and how can we address it? Uh, so it's. Um, so, gentlemen's I, time has expired. You, in, this, in this example, it's the aggregate of the excrement of the commons with all the cows that becomes a serious problem, is it? Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the members of our panel. Uh, Mr. Rader, I'm not sure we need any more examples of things gone awry, and, and I think we want to find out how far up the chain some of this goes. But I do want to ask you about one particularly remarkable incident uh, during the time that you were at SP. It's around 2001 in. Uh, my understanding is that you were asked uh, to do work on raiding a collateralized debt obligation called Pinstripe. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the collateral, uh, collateral debt obligation is essentially a, a collection of the different mortgage-backed securities, and I think you were asked to look at one segment of those mortgage-backed securities. Is that accurate? I was asked to put a rating on a bond that had been rated by Fitch and was being included in the CDO. Okay. Now, the foundation for the ratings analysis is usually the value of the underlying mortgages? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I suppose the information like the credit worthiness of the borrower, uh, the borrower's credit score, uh, things of that nature would be important to you? That was the tape that we asked for. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I want to get into. You sent an email, uh, and in the email on March 19, 2001, you asked for collateral tapes. What, what was on the collateral tapes that you saw? That would have been the information on every loan that was in the pool. It would have had the FICO score. It would have had the loan to value information, the kind of uh, note that was written, whether it was fixed or floating, a uh, variety of um, information about the, the house's price, where it was located. The tape had about, at that time, 85 or 90 data points for every loan on the tape. Now, to most of us sitting here, that seems like a reasonable request. I mean, it seems exactly what we would expect somebody to do in underwriting, whether or not they were going to make that rating. But the S&P executive in charge of those ratings, uh, Mr. Richard Gugliata, is that how you say yes. his name? Uh, I want to show you uh, an email he sent back to you uh, when you made that request. He's answered back, any request for loan level tapes is totally unreasonable. And he made the words totally unreasonable in bold. Most investors don't have it and can't provide it. Nevertheless, we must, again in bold, produce a credit estimate. It is your responsibility to provide those credit estimates and your responsibility to devise some method for doing so. Now, that's a little hard for us to understand, given what we just discussed and the need for those documents. So you were assessed to assign a credit risk for mortgage securities that back the CDO. Now you're being ordered, apparently, to give the rating without having the backup information that you need. You forwarded that email on to a number of other officials at uh, S&P, and uh, here's what you wrote, and I quote, this is the most amazing memo I've ever received in my business career. Oh. Um, Why did you write that, and what did you intend to imply by that? Well, it was copied to the uh, chief of uh, credit quality in the structured finance group, and earlier in the, the memo I had also said, I want some guidance from Mr. Gillis to tell me what we're supposed to do, because otherwise I have no intention of providing guest ratings for anybody. And there were no responses to the memo, so we just let it die. We never gave them a rating. Never gave them a rating? No. Good for you. The, uh, uh, Mr. Egan, what's your reaction to that scenario, uh, that somebody would send a, an email to Mr. Rader uh, demanding that he get a rating without the backup materials? Uh, I think it's, it's, un, it's reasonable if you're being paid by the issuers, and it's unreasonable if you have the investor's interests at heart. Okay. Let me ask all of you this. Why wouldn't the government just get out of the business of certifying 
uh, agencies like yours. Uh, why wouldn't we just say that this is too fraught with error and problems and risk on that? Uh, we're going to get out of the business of certifying agencies and we'll establish our own standards. Yeah. And then you can do what you want to do. We can't put you out of business and it will be an overstep to do that. But there's no reason we should certify you as a government. You give your ratings and let the market decide whether or not you're worthy of them and whoever on that, and to show, sort out the conflicts issue. But we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to step in and be the regulators instead of contract it out to you. Why wouldn't we do that? Mr. Egan, well, you want to start? I could respond to that just a yeah. little bit. There is no reason why, under the current circumstance, that you don't take those steps. There's right. a big difference in this market between the, the rating at issue and the surveillance. A breakdown occurred both in the proper sizing of the rating at issue, but surveillance has been atrocious. Right. And the NRSRO designation that's been provided to the three majors, and I believe AM Best, there may be others, it doesn't distinguish across what kind of ratings you can get. If you get rid of that designation, you can keep the uh, investment uh, policy guidelines to say, if you are the investment manager, you have to get two ratings, but let the responsibility fall on the investor to find the best rating and then to find the best surveillance that will keep them informed on a timely basis as to how that rating is performing. Wouldn't that so be the better course, Mr. Fons, do you agree? Yes, I advocated that in my oral testimony that the NSO designation should be abolished. So Mr. Egan, you agree the, as well? Uh, the government has been part of the problem in this industry. Uh, we, uh, it took us 12 years and, uh, uh, to obtain the NRS role. And when yet you, oh, excuse me, Mr. Egan. When you say the government is part of the problem, you're referring to the SEC? The SEC, okay. exactly. Um, uh, it took us 12 years to obtain an NRS role, and yet there is proof that we had a, uh, a study from the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Board of Kansas City and from Stanford and Michigan that, uh, that pointed out that we had much better ratings than S&P and Moody's, but yet there is still no response. Um, in that time period, what has happened is that because the government only recognized those few rating firms and continued this, this unsound business model, uh, to, you know, permitted it, uh, it's enabled uh, uh, you know, the issuer compensated rating firms to grow much faster, much further, and to have a more consolidated industry than it would be otherwise. Think of the equity research uh, industry. There's a lot of different equity research uh, uh, shops out there. In the case of the rating industry, they're really, as uh, Jim Grant said, is a two and a half firm industry. That was before we got the NRS show, and now he, he puts us uh, you know, in the category. But I think that what has to happen at this point, it's clear we have a breakdown. Uh, what has to happen is something that gives confidence for the investors that aren't in the market, and they happen to be, in many cases, non-U.S. investors, the Asian and European investors, to get back in the market, because they can't do the work themselves. They have to be able to rely on a credible agent to be able to properly assess credit quality. Uh, you're not going to change significantly S&P and Moody's and Fitch's way of doing business. You can't do it. These are rating opinions. They'll remain rating opinions. Is what's needed is an alternative business model to be more or less on the same plane so that people can have some confidence and get back into the market and get credit flowing again. Well, I, I just would make my point, if I might, uh, on that. I think it can change the nature of their model because we could set standards as the, at the Security Exchange Commission saying that we don't accept it when the investor makes the payments, the issuer makes the payments, as opposed to uh, the investors. Uh, and, we've and argued that for that. The government setting in and protecting that conflict and then leaving it there. Uh, but other than that, you know, I, I think the idea is right, Mr. Ray is right. You know, set the standards and leave your, your standards out there, but don't start picking winners and losers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, July 10, 2007, uh, Moody's downgraded over 450 mortgage backed securities. It placed another 239 on review for possible downgrade. Although many of these bonds were not rated highly to begin with, Moody's had awarded some of them as its highest rating of triple A. So uh, the committee has obtained an internal uh, Moody's email written the next day, July 11, 2007. I think it's going to be up on the screens in a moment. And this email was written by Moody's Vice President, 
who took multiple calls with investors who were irate about these downgrades. And I would like to get your reaction uh, to these comments. First, the email describes a call with an investor from the company PIMCO. And the Vice President writes, PIMCO and others have previously been very vocal about their disagreement over Moody's ratings and their methodology. He cited several meetings they have had questioning Moody's rating methodologies and assumptions. And he feels that Moody's has a powerful control over Wall Street. But it's frustrated that Moody's doesn't stand up to Wall Street. They're disappointed that this is the case. Moody has towed the line. Someone up there just wasn't on top of it, he said and mistakes were so obvious. So this goes to Mr. Fons. Uh, PIMCO is a very highly regarded investor management. It's run by Bill Gross, who is widely regarded as one of the nation's most experienced fixed income uh, investors. Does it surprise you, Mr. Fons, that PIMCO would be so critical of Moody's? No, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I've personally met with folks at PIMCO and they are very eager to express their opinions about how they think the ratings should be run and how we should be doing our business. So this, this doesn't surprise me at all. And this email also describes a similar call with an investor from Vanguard, which is one of the nation's leading mutual fund companies. According to the email, Vanguard expressed frustration with the rating agency's willingness to allow issues to get away with murder. And so again, Mr. Fons, why would Vanguard say credit rating agencies allow people to get away with murder? I think it is it's, they're, they're addressing the rating shopping issue, the erosion in standards that were, were <laughs> obviously clear to them and clear to many others in the market, um, and, and the delay. Um, by the rating agencies to recognize the underlying problem and to adjust their methodologies and ratings accordingly. Um, I want to read three more lines, and they're up on the screen. Vanguard reports, it feels like there's a big party out there. The agencies are giving issues every benefit of the doubt. Vanguard said that portfolio managers at Vanguard begin to see problems in the work of the rating agencies beginning about 18 months ago. At first we thought that these problems were isolated events. Then there became isolated trends. Now they are normal trends. And these trends are getting worse and not getting better. So Mr. Egan, down at the end, yes. uh, what do you make of this email and do you agree that these isolated events turn into worsening trends? It is not at all surprising. In fact, um, uh, I, we argue that the current rating system is designed for failure, and that is exactly what we have. You know, I want to thank you, particularly Mr. Egan, because you have been one of the clear speaking people that we have had up here since we have been looking at the collapse of the market. Uh, what we need is plain English to try to unscramble uh, these eggs that we find ourselves in, and they are rotten eggs at this time. So I appreciate all the panel being here, and I appreciate clear responses that the public out there can understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Ms. Back. Watson. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I also want to thank the witnesses. Uh, I also have the uh, dubious honor of serving on the Financial Services Committee. In our hearing yesterday, I began my remarks by saying that, uh, that I wasn't interested in, in assigning blame or responsibility uh, and that I, I was more interested in hearing about how we might go forward and build a regulatory framework that would actually be reliable and, and would secure the markets. Uh, that was the Financial Services Committee. <clears throat> this, this is the Oversight Committee which actually, in my opinion, does have a responsibility to, to identify uh, those who, who are responsible and to, to hope, in a way, to, to hold those uh, 
people accountable. It, it is a fact that Moody's and Standard and Poor's, especially uh, as, as rating agencies, uh, held a special position of, of trust uh, in, in relation to investors and, and market participants. And, uh, and that over time, over the past 75 years or so, uh, investors and market participants were induced to rely on, on the ratings that, that were produced by those agencies. It's also a fact that while there were other bad actors in this crisis, none of, none of the others held a, a special responsibility a, as being a, a gatekeeper or, or to serve as a firewall uh, in the event that this toxicity arrived uh, in order to prevent it from, first of all, being systemic and then, in this case, uh, actually going global. Uh, but the rating agencies facilitated that. By putting AAA stamps on this, they, they induced people to rely. They were facilitators of allowing this system, this, this whole problem to, to go system-wide and then, and then go global. And as a result, I have a lot of families in my district and across America that uh, they've had their life savings wiped out. They've had their pensions cut in half. Uh, they, they, their, their investments have disappeared. Some have been thrown out of their houses. I've got retirees that are coming out of retirement asking me to help them find them a job in this economy. So there's a real human side to this that I think sometimes the rating agencies and some of our financial firms don't recognize. Uh, my constituents were not in a position to understand what, what a binomial expansion was or, or they did not have the ability to scrutinize the different tranches of, of uh, securities. They just did not have that uh, ability and they weren't sophisticated like that. But they did know what AAA meant. They knew what AAA meant and what it's meant for the past 75 to 100 years. And they relied on that. And they were induced to rely on that. These, these securities are so complex. People in America and across, across the globe knew what AAA meant because Moody's and, and, and Standard & Poor's uh, as agencies were trusted. They were trusted to be accurate and honest. And uh, that was then. Uh, I have a lot of people in my district who feel that they've been defrauded. And they're mad as hell. And, and, and they think that in light of what has happened to them, that someone ought to go to jail. Someone ought to go to jail. And the more I hear in these hearings, the more I read, I am inclined to agree with them. I am inclined to agree. And, uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, you know, Mr. Regan, you've been very helpful, uh, and, and I just want to uh, touch on one, one of the things that it's the root of this, and that is this uh, forum shopping, uh, rating shopping. Uh, I want to ask you about the problem of rating shopping. Uh, when the investment banks go around and, and take their mortgage-backed securities to various credit agencies to see which one will give them the highest rating. And under the current system, uh, a, a, a rating agency gets paid by, by the issuer, as we've, we've talked about here. Uh, let me show you an example. We have an email that was sent on May 25, 2004, from uh, one of the managing directors at Standard & Poor's to two of the company's top executives. The subject line of this email is competition with Moody's. That's, that's in the top. It says this, we just launched a huge Mizuho RMBS, which is residential mortgage-backed security deal, to Moody's due to a huge difference in the required credit support level. That's the amount of uh, uh, other, other mortgages supporting the, the upper tranche. A little further on, the S&P official explains how Moody's was able to steal away the deal by using a more lenient methodology to evaluate the risk. He says this, quote, they ignored commingling risk and for the interest rate risk, they took a stance that if the interest rate rises, they'll just downgrade the deal. Mr. Reitner, uh, you used to work at Standard & Poor's. And uh, were, were officials at the company concerned about losing rating deals to your, to your competitors? Well, <clears throat> I believe that might have been a deal that was rated in Tokyo. And in the United States, we had, as I believe my statement explains, we had delivered our models out to the street. So there was no real rating uh, shopping in our market share because they could basically run the pool of mortgages through the model on their own desk and get exactly the same answer that we got. Are you now, saying there's Moody's a difference in what you did in the Asian market versus what you did here? I'm sorry? 
Are you saying there's a difference in what you did in the Asian market versus what you did here? Yes. There was a difference in every market. The U.S. market had its criteria. Japan had a separate set of criteria. Spain, England, based on the, the nature and structures of the market and the securities. But, but this is Moody's stealing work from, from accounts from S&P and, and vice versa. So this is, this is competition between the two firms we're talking about here. Predominantly, yes, it was between the you two know, firms because whether, whether you're stealing work that's that's being underwritten in, in Asia or in the United States, it's the it's the conflict between the firms is that is what I'm getting at. Conflict between look, criteria. Let me, let me ask, Mr. Fonts, you were a senior official at Moody's. Uh, uh, gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Do you want to uh, conclude with one last question? Sure, sure. This will be it. Now, let me read the rest of the email after describing the loss to Moody's and the S and P uh, officials say this: This is so significant that it could have been. It could have an impact on future deals. There's no way we can get back on this one, get back this one, but we need to address this now in preparation for future deals. I had a discussion with the team leaders, and we think the only way to compete is to have a paradigm shift in thinking, especially with interest rate risk. And, uh, you know, it just, in, in my, my last question would be, Mr. Regan, what are your views about these emails? It seems to say, well, indicate that credit rating agencies are engaged in a, a race to the bottom uh, in terms of credit ratings quality. And I'd just like to hear your, your comments on it. And I, and I thank you for your forbearance, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we have had ample evidence that rating shopping is alive and well. And when you couple that with the fact that uh, ratings have been viewed as opinions and therefore there is relatively little uh, downside to inaccurate opinions, you have the condition that has led to the collapse that we are experiencing. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Credit rating agencies are, are viewed as the source of uh, information for independent analysis. Investors, and that includes the families in my district who purchase these projects, um, they look for the credit rating agency to speak to the financial conditions, the credit worthiness, so that they can assess their risk or lack of risk. I want to cite an April 26 uh, New York Times piece that was called Triple Failure. And I quote from it, Moody's used statistical models to access CDOs. It relied on historical patterns of default. It assumed the past would remain relevant in an era in which the mortgage industry was metamorphing into a wildly speculative business. In fact, the chief executive of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase said, and I quote, there was a large failure of common sense by the rating agencies. Mr. Fons, uh, from your testimony, I quote from it, quote, the focus of Moody shifted from protecting the investor to being a market-driven organization. So my questions for you, gentlemen. I want to ask about July 10, 2007, when Moody's downgraded over 450 mortgage-backed securities and threatened to downgrade over 200 others. The investors were irate because Moody had previously rated some of these bonds as triple A, equivalent to uh, Treasury. Uh, so one of the documents that the committee has attained in Moody's internal email from July 12, 2007, two days, only two days after these downgrades, shows how these complaints continued and they rose all the way up to the CEO level. In this email, uh, Moody's officials described a tough phone call with the chief investment officer at Fortis Investment. The Moody official wrote that the Fortis Invest investor requested to speak to someone very senior very quickly. She said she was extremely frustrated and had a few choice words. And here's what she told the Moody's official. Quote, if you can't figure out the loss ahead of the fact, what's the use of your ratings? Quote, you have legitimized these things, referring to subprime and ABS, uh, that's asset-backed uh, uh, CDOSs, as uh, leading people into dangerous risk. Quote again. If the ratings are BS, the only use in ratings is to compare BS relatively to BS. Mr. Fonz used to work at Moody, so my question for you is going to be, that's a pretty damning indictment of the entire system. 
uh, to, to use the phrase, and I quote her again, to use only ratings as compared BS relatively to BS. So my question to you, does uh, Fordyce have a point? Absolutely. There, um, the, the deterioration in standards was palpable. As I said, um, evidence first arose at least in 2006 that things were slipping. And the analysts and the managers, for whatever reason, turned a blind eye to this, did not update their models or their thinking, and um, you know, allowed this to go on. And, and what, the, what the, these investors are most upset about clearly is the fact that a AAA was downgraded. AAAs had historically been very stable ratings through time. And so there was, there was an implicit compact, if you will, that the AAA rating was to be something that was to last for at least uh, you know, several years um, without, without uh, losing that rating. And when you see something go from AAA to a low rating in such a short period of time, clearly that, that's evidence of, of a, a massive mistake somewhere. And so she's venting her frustration. So the AAA is like the gold standard. It is, yeah. It's, it's, it's the brand. That's what the Moody's is, is selling. According to uh, the email, a uh, forest investment manager had come to Moody's the year before to discuss her concerns about the company's mythology. So she had been concerned before. In fact, she told Moody's, quote, that she and other investors had formed a steering group to try to get the rating agency to listen to the need of the investors. So Mr. Uh, Egan or Mr. Ratner, what does it say about a system when the investors, the people these ratings are supposed to be serving, their customer, their customer has to form a steering group just so the credit agencies won't ignore them. What does that say about uh, the credit agencies? Well, I just think it's a further indictment that there was a big breakdown between the people that were trying to maximize profits and the people that were trying to maximize the uh, credit uh, ratings methodology and activities and that the people at the, uh, with the profit motive won. Mr. Egan? Um, I think it, uh, it, it is similar uh, to a, a Yiddish saying, which is that we have to get smart quickly, okay? That we're stupid right now. The system is stupid. Uh, we need to make some adjustments. It's not fair and is not going to be a good use of your time and energy and effort to try and curb the behavior of S&P and Moody's and Fitch. Why? Because that's the way they're set up. Uh, ratings are opinion and you're stuck. Accept them for what they are and go around and get another check and balance in the system. Yes, the investors are, are upset, but you need to provide a pathway for some other independent voices. We're out there. There are other firms that are out there that are similar to us, but we have a, we have a small voice compared to S&P and Moody's. And so, yeah, we can continue along the current path, have more failures. You know, the U.S. slips in, in importance. The financial services industry is one of the most important industries, and we've seen it fall apart. We can continue along the path, or else we can take some tangible actions to correct the problems. And I think that's what will be much more fruitful than, than beating up on S&P and Moody's for doing what they have an incentive to do, basically, which is to issue the ratings that will will satisfy the people who pay 90 percent of their bills, that is, the issuers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. We're checking out that Yiddish uh, Thank you. quote there to see if it's accurate. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems like the rating agencies were ignoring risk in two directions. We've talked a lot about one direction, which is that they were ignoring the risk inherent, it seems, in these these subprime mortgage-backed uh, securities by not doing the level of due diligence that, that they should have done, or once they'd done it, sort of ignoring the, the analysis that they'd perform. But in the other direction, I gather they were also, um, they were also enhancing the status of these risky securities based on the fact that the investment banks were going out um, and p purchasing this, quote, insurance in the form of the credit default swaps, which were themselves very risky instruments. So you had this kind of perverse situation where uh, because the CDS was there, that kind of insurance product, they would take something that was already risky and suggest that somehow the risk had been reduced because you'd gone and gotten this, this insurance product, this CDS product, which we know from our AIG uh, hearings 
was, was inherently risky itself. And I just ask a couple of you to speak very briefly to that side of the equation as well, in terms of them ignoring this, this credit. I, I'd like to. Um, first of all, the insurance that the rating agencies looked to was typically from a monoline insurer to back mm -hmm. the uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities. The credit default swap activity you mentioned was typically used by financial institutions to hedge their exposures to these things. And so it would have been on the financial institutions rating side where they would be uh, depending on that uh, right. or, 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 these, or these institutions were at least, um, you know, uh, uh, asserting that this protected them right. to but a certain But the rating extent. agencies were giving them some credit for that, were yes, they Yes. I think, I think they, yeah. they counted that as, as hedging activity to a certain extent. Um, yeah. yeah. In fact, the, I'm glad you brought up the monolines. Um, uh, we were uh, on the record uh, probably about um, uh, 18 months ago. Uh, in fact, even earlier than that, in 2003, um, I was, uh, I think I was quoted in Fortune in saying that uh, MBIA is not a AAA rated credit. AAA is a special standard. It, it basically, it means that an obligor can pay its obligations come hell or high water. No, no matter what, they can pay the obligations. And there are relatively few issuers that rise to that, that high level. And in our opinion, the monolines didn't fit that. Uh, basically, we looked at their, um, their uh, liabilities and uh, found that they had, uh, was it exposure to, I think it was about uh, $30 billion in collateralized debt obligations. We took a 30 percent haircut on it. It was $10 billion. And we said those are just a pipeline losses. And uh, to cover it, to come up to the AAA, they'd have to raise about three times that. So that would have been $30 billion just for one issuer. That was AMBAC. We multiplied that through by about seven issuers and we got it was 210, but we backed it down to $200 billion. We issued that statement publicly, I think it was probably about nine months ago. And mm. a lot of people said we were ridiculous. But that is the crux, right. that these okay. are not triple A's. And there, a lot of people have been uh, making investment decisions and have not taken markdowns, assuming that they're true triple A's. But yet, you know, uh, we're talking about bailing out the supposedly triple A rated firms. It makes no sense. Right. And the sooner we get back to reality, the better off we'll be. Thank you. Let me ask you, Mr. Fines, because um, this sort of follows up on Mr. Tierney these questions earlier about kind of what do we do next. Um, in your testimony, you said you talk about wholesale change, right? That's the term you use. And you talk about change at the governance and senior management levels. And um, you don't really buy the notion that the, the reforms that have been announced so far uh, meet that standard. Um, I was reading ahead a little bit um, uh, the testimony of Mr. Sharma, who's coming next where he talks about 27 new initiatives and other things that have been undertaken um, to address the, the breakdown that you've all alluded to, um, you know, new governance procedures and controls, analytical changes focusing on substant substantive analysis, changes to information we use in the analysis, new ways to communicate. He basically lists out everything which is what the rating agencies should have been doing in the first place. I mean, it's not like saying, we got to come along and change a couple of things. If you read the list, it's basically saying everything we, we were supposed to do, we weren't doing, now we're going to start doing it. Which gets you to the question of you can change procedures, you can change controls, you can change protocols, et cetera. But why should we trust the same people who ignored these warnings um, to fix the problem in a way that means it's not going to happen going forward? So I think that's what you're getting at. If you could just speak to that a little bit more specifically, I'd appreciate it. For I, us. I, I think it, this is exactly what I meant, is that, is that you still have the same overall incentives in place, you still have the same structures, and as you said, they should have been doing those things in the first place. These are not reforms. These are just doing business properly and doing them better. Um, so at the governance level, you need the board of directors um, who are actually acting in shareholders' interest, and that interest is preserving the franchise and preserving the reputation of the firm. And I did didn't see that happening. They were they were interested in hiring good businessmen and seeing a business run. And and as I said, that's why I'm, I've advocated wholesale change yeah. at those levels. Um, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. I'd just point out that's going to be there's going to be huge resistance to that notion because the same people that were part of this are going to want to say we screwed up, things broke down, but we know how to fix it and everything will be fine going forward. And we're going to have to look we're going to have to look past that. Thank you. Well, members of the Sarbanes family have heard that story before. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. You, um, 
have provided us with uh, a, a definition of corruption that I think is bone chilling. I, I can't begin to tell you how dismayed I am by what you have told us today. Mr. Egan, let me uh, start with you. You said that in 2003 you alerted Congress to what was coming down. It sounds like Congress didn't listen to you. Um, you don't have to respond to that, but I want to ask you a question today. Uh, what's the next shoe that's going to fall? And maybe we can listen to you this time. Uh, people pay us a lot of money to get that answer. <laughs> Uh, it, it basically, there are a series. Um, uh, you have a breakdown in all the, um, you have the investment banks that are way undercapitalized right now. Uh, investment now commercial banks that are way undercapitalized. You have the commercial banks that are undercapitalized. You have the money market funds that, can't, that are, are in fear of breaking the, the buck. So basically anything that isn't propped up by the Fed or the Treasury is going to drop. Unfortunately, and what is need, and it should drop actually. It should drop until it reaches a point where it's sustainable. So there's a variety. We tell our uh, that our clients that there are certain that the ecosystem, if you will, in funding has broken down. Okay, from everybody connected with the mortgage market, you've seen them uh, fall. You know, the mortgage brokers, the mortgage bankers, the investment banks, the commercial banks, they're all in terrible shape. So if you want to protect your, your investments, there are certain industries that you want to look at that aren't dependent on that, that ecosystem and aren't dependent on the consumers uh, that will do all right. So it's basically, and this came up in a, an interview I had yesterday on Bloomberg Television, is basically those uh, firms that are either propped up by the federal government, okay, and that propping will re remain, you know, won't expire after 2009, uh, which is a case of Fannie and Freddie. Um, uh, but is prop are propped up by the federal government or are not dependent on the ecosystem or anything directly or indirectly connected to that ecosystem. All right. Thank you. I would like to um, move to the motivation for much of what you have told us today, which appears to be money. Um, I want to show you how the revenues for these rating residential mortgage-backed securities and CDOs became a significant part of these rating agencies' bottom lines. Let's start with S&P. Uh, as you can see from this chart, S&P increased its share of revenue uh, for rating mortgage-backed securities from 24 percent of U.S. rating revenue in 2002 to as much as 37 percent in 2006. Let's now uh, show you Fitch. As you can see from this chart, Fitch's revenues for rating these bonds increased steadily, accounting for 35 percent of its U.S. rating revenue in 2004 and 2005 before dropping slightly in 2006. Now, we have a slightly different uh, chart with Moody, Moody's, but it shows the same trend. By 2006, Moody's Structural Finance Division, which rates mortgage-backed securities and CDOs, accounted for more than half of the company's total rating revenue. So profits have played a huge role in the rating of these exotic instruments. Is that not the case? And if you could just each indicate that. Well, <clears throat> profits were what drove it starting in about 2001 at Standard & Poor's. It was the growth in the market and the growth. Closer, profits were running the show. I mean, in a nutshell, that was a simple answer. And the business managers that were in charge were just wanted to get as much of the revenue as they saw in charts like this growing out in the street into their coffers. And the, the breakdown, in my opinion, was that while we're, we can talk about or you all can consider different ways of fixing the, uh, the rating agency's current situation, but by and large, the analysts as we've seen in the emails, they were honest, hard-working people, and they were sending messages to the business managers through the MDs, et cetera, and they weren't getting any response. So there was a big breakdown, and that reputation that was lost was, shouldn't be totally blamed on the analysts because most of them were trying to do the right thing. But the money became so great that the, the management lost focus. In residential mortgages alone, 
just that piece of the business from 1995, when I joined the firm to 2005, grew from $16 million a year for S&P to $150 plus million, tenfold increase. And the market was just being driven. It was being driven by low interest rates, by these new products that were coming out so fast and furious that it took a lot of uh, money to track them and analyze them, and the money wasn't available. So our analysts spent their time just trying to get the ratings out the door and to alert management what was going on, and none of that money was plowed back and reinvested. And I firmly believe that had we continued to track at the loan level those new products, we would have seen things in 2004, 2005 that would have forewarned us. And when you talk about the way these deals work, you can't lose fact that AAA bond has support, just like you should have equity in your house. The support underneath that was established by the rating. With more information about those new products, that support requirement could have gone up significantly and made some of those products uneconomic to originate. But because they weren't tracking the data, they weren't allowing the analysts to collect it and analyze it continuously, those alerts waited until 2007 when everything collapsed. There were good people in those firms at Moody's and S&P and Fitch that saw what was coming and they tried to make management aware of it. And money was the overriding concern at the top of the firm. And the point Mr. Sarbanes made is right on the money. Some of these people are the same ones that brought Enron and WorldCom to us, and now they're going to give us another list of things. And if you go back and check, a lot of things on that list they promised to do after Enron and WorldCom exploded, and they still haven't done it. So the same people are still in charge of the hen house. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Spear. Expired. Um, um, uh, Mr. Shays. We passed Sarbanes Oxley in response to WorldCom and Enron, and uh, Oxley was pretty strong, uh, Sarbanes was stronger because by then WorldCom went under. The scariest hearing I've ever had that uh, rivals this by far was when Enron went under. The boards of directors didn't direct, the administration didn't manage properly, the employees didn't speak out, the law firms were in cahoots, the um, uh, rating agencies were just in left field. Every part of the system broke down, so we passed Sarbanes-Oxley. What I want to ask is from the three of you, how is it possible when the German company that was looking at was Viva, Veba, V-E-B-A, was looking to unite two equals at Enron, uh, that they determined that um, Enron had taken 70 percent of its stuff off the books and that they had about a $2 billion uh, unfunded uh, liability that was not recognized. And still, the rating agencies rated this company like it was an extraordinarily well-run company, even after that. I happen to think the rating agencies are useless now. I think they have no brand. I wouldn't trust them if I had money to invest. Uh, so the second part of my question is, tell me how they get their brands back. Tell me why there should just be the so-called big three when they actually, had they done their job, we wouldn't be in this mess. So walk me through that. Mr. Egan, you can start. Well, thank you. First of all, I prefer that you use an adjective in front of the noun rating firm because we are a rating firm, but our behavior, our actions are significantly different than the issuer compensated. I, you know, think I don't want to get into that. I'm sorry. You've had your chance to do that. But frankly, I think buyers have almost as much conflict as sellers. So I'm not as impressed with that point. Just tell me why the rating agencies failed to identify what happened at Enron, why the whole banking community failed to undersee it. I don't get it. Well, you know, we're not geniuses, and, and we got it, okay? Uh, why do we get it? Well, because in Enron's case, the business model failed. Same as in WorldCom's case. 
Enron's core business was, and, and they were smart in one way, but they didn't is have it, the right vision. Is that really vision. an indication we didn't understand the business model with all this, these new instruments that they're, they're like Greek to the rating agencies even? I think you get rid of the people that did understand it. I think there's an incentive. In fact, there's some articles. Uh, Aaron Lachetti of the Wall Street Journal documented how some analysts were, were sounding the alarm and uh, they didn't maintain market share and they were, one way or another, they are pushed out the door. Mr. Rader. Well, if the broader question is how do you think uh, they might go about regaining I want to regaining... know first about Enron. I don't get it. I don't understand why none of the rating agencies didn't take a second look when this deal fell apart uh, and the German company said this company has $2 billion of unfunded liabilities. I don't get it. Why, why wouldn't that have shown up? But Well, <clears throat> either they weren't digging deep enough or they weren't looking in the right place. I mean, there are, as Mr. Uh, Egan has suggested, human beings involved in this. I don't believe on the S&P side there was fraud. It might have been a little uh, less than diligent in terms of I, the work they did, but they come back with the fact that it's an opinion. And Mr. in the Fons, rating agency, we don't do diligence. They I, don't, always I, don't, I, I don't get it. Mr. I, I, think, I think the mistake was talking to those companies in the first place instead of sitting down and as, as a disinterested observer and looking at the financials and looking at anybody. But Price Waterhouse did the due diligence for the German company and said, don't go there. Yeah. Had they done that, they could do that. They... Well, Price Waterhouse did it. The deal fell through and the yeah. rating agency still rated Enron uh, quite significant. Yeah. I mean, uh, there were a lot of mistakes made in the Enron situation and, and rating agencies, uh, you the know, tried to The last question then is, mm -hmm. is it conceivable that the rating agencies just don't understand the market that they're having to evaluate? that they don't understand these instruments. And if that's the case, do they have a moral right not to rate the, uh, the, these, these businesses? I, I think the, the overall track record of rating agencies have been, up until this time, pretty good. They have successfully differentiated defaulters from non-defaulters. That's the job of the rating system. The, the, the track record is what allowed the reputation to grow. They built, and then they built that reputation and milked it for what they could and, and started lowering standards. But for overtime, credit analysis is a okay. reputable discipline. I think it's doable. It's just, you know, um, well, let me they just fell say apart. That they, have, they have no brand. They have no credibility whatsoever. I can't imagine any investor trusting them. There, it's going to be a while to build that up. I agree. Gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this hearing is about something that's been on the minds of lots of people and trying to figure out how did this happen. And they go back to the credit rating agencies and the enormous, apparently undeserved respect they have enjoyed. Uh, I want to ask about a word I have not heard before, ratings withdrawal, where apparently after a credit agency uh, rates a security, uh, the agency can be terminated uh, if there is a threat to downgrade the security. Now, look, I'm not making this up, am I? I mean, this is true. Um, I want to refer to a few examples. March 8th, uh, New York Times this year uh, report that the world's largest bond insurance company, MBIA, fired Fitch uh, ratings because Fitch was considering downgrading the company's bonds from AAA to some lower rating of some kind. Uh, according to the Times, all three rating agencies had rated MBIA's bonds, but only Fitch uh, was considering a downgrade, and I'm familiar with that happening in cities and states all the time. One rating agency does one thing and the others don't. Uh, Mr. Egan, you mentioned this specific incident, uh, incident, I believe, in your written testimony. How does it affect an agency's ratings? If that agency knows it can be fired any time it downgrades a bond, well, uh, I, I, you have to assume that it's uh, considered very carefully. Uh, if you're relying on the issuers for compensation, you hate to see that revenue go away. In our case, 
we never had MBIA at AAA. It never rose to that level. I think our current rating is down about uh, single B or thereabouts, which is about nine notches, which is uh, lower than the others. That's a Grand Canyon type difference. They never uh, fired us, uh, that's MBIA, because they never hired us. Um, so uh, as far as your specific question about firing, uh, yes, it would have a bigger uh, uh, impact uh, How could on it, the yeah, firms. It, it seems. I, I think we <laughs> had policy. We had policies that would not that we would not withdraw a rating just because somebody said you're fired. Um, we would, if we believed and we had enough information to, to rate the thing, Ed Woody's, we would continue to rate it. They couldn't fire us. They could fire us. They could not pay us. But we would still uh, offer our opinion and express well, our first amendment. Well, yeah, but then then you'd have the situation that Fitch had, where apparently it tried to keep rating a company called Radian. Uh, even without the company's cooperation, and don't you have to have the company's cooperation? I don't believe so. I believe it, it's not helpful. <laughs> uh, we have quite a conundrum here, don't, don't we? Um, here's another example: Fitch, uh, 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 the radi the company Radian that that I was speaking of, downgraded uh, this insurance company from A to A minus, and a, a publication called Business Wire. <laughs> Uh, the day after, that was on September the 6th, 2007, uh, said that Radian sent a, quote, formal request that Fitch immediately withdraw all of its ratings on Radian. Now, are you concerned that, that, that this practice, first of all, do, when you get something, is that unusual? Say, so just withdraw all your ratings. No, it, it, it's not. In fact, sometimes you don't even get hired. Uh, you, it, it, it's an, another manifestation of the rating shopping. Basically, if you're not going to go along with the highest rating possible, there's a good chance that you won't be hired initially to do the rating well, how about or you'll be just, fired just later. take all my ratings off. You have to do that if they ask for it as they did we, here, Mr. Vaughn. We had, we had specific policies uh, surrounding the, the withdrawal of a rating, and we would only do it under certain circumstances. What kind many. of circumstances would you do it? One would be that um, we didn't believe we had enough information to rate something. We would do it there. Um, uh, if, if the issuer disappeared or the bonds no longer existed, we'd withdraw the ratings then, for example. Could, could, could I, I spoke of a conundrum. Surely there's some way out of this. Um, but you, you can't this stop problem, these which everybody apparently knew about, it's been transparent. Everybody knew it happened. Uh, how do you deal with the pro this problem of of the of the issue of not giving you information, um, which you need in order to rate, uh, and the circular uh, the circular problem you, you find yourself in, and all of us who depend upon you, uh, therefore find ourselves in? How, how, show, show me a way out of this problem. If, if they are issuing public securities, laws are that they should disclose, there are disclosure requirements for companies. That should be sufficient to draw a, a, a rating assessment. How do you enforce that? Well, the SEC does that. Isn't that their job? Has it done it before? Um, Has SEC enforced that to your knowledge? Uh, I think in the corporate area they have, uh, but the answer here to your, your question is a little bit more subtle because what happens in the case of MBIA, because that's a current example, it's, it's an important example in the industry uh, because there's so many firms that, that are relying on MBIA's and AMBAC's uh, uh, support for various securities. Uh, if they lose that support, they're going to have to mark down those securities. Uh, what happens in the industry is that the issuer will say, in the case of Fitch, or in our case, they'll say, that rating firm, don't pay attention to their, their ratings because they don't have the additional information. And we say, Look at you look at our track record. You know we are right. Look at look at other manifestations of the deterioration of the company's uh, of, uh, fall. Um, but nonetheless, that's the company's response. That if you want the true rating, go to those that we we support that we still pay, which is a little bit odd. Um, how uh, common is this? How common is this practice of saying just withdraw the rating? I mean, is it an everyday occurrence? <laughs> The gentlelady's time has expired, but we'd like to hear an answer to the last no, it, question. It's unusual. It's what? It's it, unusual. It happens from time to time. I'm sorry. What it's, unusual. It's, it's unusual. It's unusual. It's unusual. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Davis? Mr. Chairman, I just have one more question. In, in Mr. Rader's uh, written testimony, he states that the foundation of the rating analysis is the data relied on for determining credit enhancement levels. Now, rate, rating agencies don't perform due diligence on the data. Am I right? They just rely on representations and warranties that come from the issuer that the data submitted is indeed accurate. Is that that is, <clears throat> excuse me, the structured side of the transaction is reading the documents and relying on the information provided. And we do not do diligence. Our lawyers have said that is an SEC defined term and that it is the issuers that are required to do the diligence on their uh, filings. So we relied on reps and warranties, the okay. guarantees. Then, then th th that leads to my question. I just want yes. to make sure I was right on by my understanding. <clears throat> now, the rating can only be as good then as the data that is put into the models. Correct. Uh, but there is no independent verification that the data is accurate. No independent verification of the tapes. That is correct. All right. From the loan originators and the borrowers who might have fudged homebuyers' creditworthiness, employment history, to the issuers who package these mortgages and want to get the highest possible rating, it looks to me like there were a lot of places along the line where the data that ultimately makes it to the rating agencies could be made unreliable. That it could have been made more reliable it or could have made No, that it, it could be made unreliable just as it passes Correct. through these. Okay? Now, if it is not the rating agency's job to ensure the accuracy of the data it is using to rate these securities, whose job is it? That is correct. We determined that it was uh, better to put the onus on the issuer. So it goes and to the issuer. required, as I, I spelled out, All right. the reps and warranties. Now, let me ask this. Was there a computer model that could evaluate the risks and the values uh, if you had all of the correct info through these uh, documents? I understand that a single prospectus for a mortgage backed security. I have looked at it. They run 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pages sometimes. Well, I haven't seen one quite that large, but they mm -hmm. are multiple hundreds of pages. And if they give you the detail on the tapes, they could run to quite a, an extensive length. Is there a computer model, given if you got all the information in that, and I'm not, it, it, there may probably were some inaccuracies, but if you had all that, that you could have given an appropriate evaluation? The model would give an appropriate valuation on the collateral, what the enhancement requirement Correct. was, how much insurance you need to put under the AAA bond, they were calculating the default expectations for each of the mortgages and what the loss would be if the mortgage defaulted. That was the model on the data side. The structure side of the transaction was then looking at the documents to make sure that the investors were being protected in the, in the servicing of the loans, in the pass-through of the payments. Part and parcel, and someone asked what the next shoe might be to drop, this could be another shoe that hasn't hit yet. That was the reps and warranties that were put on the data, as these loans are going bad and the, the bonds have been downgraded, there are people that are going through each one of those in foreclosure. And if they find out that the appraisal was inflated or that any other information that was supported, supplied to the rating agency was incorrect and inaccurate or just fraudulent, they have the right to put it back to the issuer. And what we are faced with today is a number of the institutions that have received government bailouts or been in fact, merged out of existence. Lehman, Whamu, uh, Bear Stearns, uh, Countrywide, and IndyMac, they were all providers of huge rep and warranty guarantees that if those loans start getting identified as having appraisal problems and put back, the question is whether the people that bailed those organizations out are going to make good on those reps and warranties. Or are they going to go by the boards and they just won't have any value? Well, you anticipated where I was going with that. Any, any comments on that, Mr. Egan? Just say Fonson? one thing. The, 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 the assumption here is that the models were right, um, uh, even if with the right data. And, and my, uh, in my opinion, that there wasn't a strong history, first of all, with the subprime mortgage market. We didn't really know how these things, there was no good model in existence. So we don't know for sure the model holds up over we don't, time because it wasn't really utilized as much. It wasn't, it hadn't, it hadn't, it hadn't been tested thoroughly, I would say, through, through, through experience. It, but, you know, you could, I think, as we go through this from here on out, you can test it and maybe refine it a little well, bit. Well, I think this will be a great test case for future securitizations. We'll, they'll be pointing to this episode. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's been a breakdown. Uh, if you look at, at the, the old model that worked, and that is where there was the, the local banker who was going to hold the paper and look at it, 
why wouldn't that local banker make sure that the property, do some spot checks. Let's say they, uh, they were going to fund 100 mortgages. Well, you don't have to check every single one, but maybe a handful to make sure that the properties were appraised properly. Check some of the documentation that is documented. Make sure that the uh, mortgagees can, can pay their, their the obligors can pay their obligations. Um, and that hasn't happened. What has happened in the market is because of the dominance of uh, the major rating firms, they've constricted what they view as their job, which might serve their interests very well, but has not served the public's interests very well. In fact, there's been a breakdown because the assumption is that if it's a AAA, it really is a AAA, that you've done what was, is necessary to ascertain that everything can be done properly, and that's not the case. So if you go back to the, and you can't, uh, you can't micromanage it and say, well, in this transaction, do this, the other one, do that. That's a, a, a waste of time. What you want to do is make sure that there's some agents in there that are protecting the ultimate investors. That's the key here. Okay. No, thank you. I bet that answers my question. Um, just to, to follow up on that point, but if, if, the rate, if the people doing the rating realized that uh, there was no no money being put in by the purchaser of the home because they were borrowing the down payment as well as the, the rest of the loan, uh, one would have assumed that they might have concluded that uh, this is more likely to be a default, wouldn't they? Absolutely. And, and just rate it as such. That's all. You know, it's like the 90-year-old man that I gave as an insurance company. It's fine that there's certain segments of the population that maybe because the houses are appreciating, you know they're going to appreciate. For other, maybe there's a big plant going in that area and there's a bargain deal that the builder. It's fine that you actually rate those, but make sure you rate it properly. Make sure that, again, that there's an alignment. There's sometimes money to be, in fact, right now, there's an a lot of opportunity to be made in the mortgage area. Area. You don't have money flowing in there because people have seen the ratings slam down. So now when, when let's say, the, you're being priced at about 40 cents of the dollar, you could see half the portfolio disappear and you'll still make your money back. People, institutions aren't putting money into it because, again, the ratings aren't high enough. They're, they're, they're double B. And so we'll go to investors and say, hey, listen, on a, a new money basis, it should be rated higher than what, what it is. There's some interest, but the ratings are so key in this whole process. You have to fix that problem. Well, I thank the three of you very much. Ratings are key. And uh, they, they, uh, they are relied on by, uh, uh, by investors. And when they see a AAA rating, investors assume that this is a good investment even though there's no liability if they just made up an opinion without having uh, the facts to substantiate that opinion. And that's one of the reasons we're in the situation we're in today and why we've had uh, this hearing. So I thank the three of you uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, we're going to now move on to the next panel. But before we move on, move on to the next panel, I'd like to make a clarification for the record. In my opening statement, I referenced an email written by a Moody's employee named Christopher Mahoney. It has now come to our attention that although Mr. Mahoney was the author of the email, he was forwarding the opinion of somebody outside of the company. So I do want that uh, to be uh, clarified. Uh, we'll, we'll be glad to give you that information. Uh, we uh, now move on to our second panel. And uh, We'd like to call, uh, well, while we're, while we're uh, making this transition, why don't we have a, a five-minute recess, if that's okay. Mr. Just Joint. Settle Mr. down, Joint. and those who are yes, leaving will leave, and those who are coming in will come in. Does so we'll have a five-minute recess. That's really, this is a good housekeeping seal of approval being broken. But the incentives were perverse. Thank you.
So we should be regulated. Provides that the things So this uh, hearing is in a short break. I uh, want to uh, let you know that in uh, just a few minutes, we're going to be bringing you uh, a live event from Virginia with Senator Barack Obama. Until then, uh, here's a look at the latest Reuters C-SPAN Zogby polling data for campaign 2008. The numbers show Senator Barack Obama up 52% in the latest poll to John McCain's 40.